Excuse Welcome me. to the January 23rd regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee. I'm Len Carden, chair of the committee. Our condolences go to Dr. Bodhi, uh, whose father passed away this weekend, uh, and she's not with us tonight. Uh, Ms. Morgan has the flu and is also not with us, and uh, Mr. Thielman and, and uh, Ms. Seuss will be joining us shortly. Uh, we're starting tonight with new artwork from the Dallin School. Uh, over on board A, which is back there, yes. Uh, board A is Imagined, Imagine, Imagined Machines, a STEAM project for kindergarten through grade, grade three artists. First, the K-3 artist read the story, Rosie Revere, Engineer, by Andrea Beattie. The students were then encouraged to imagine what kind of machine they would create. When they had an idea, students selected a paper that had a small machine part, such as a gear glued to it. Students were invited to begin drawing the parts of a machine around the gear on the paper. The student artists filled their papers and included such details as labels, titles, and color. The results are imaginative and innovative. Board B, over here, letters of STEAM, art project for artists in grades K-3. Uh, STEAM is an acronym for the studies of science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Students were encouraged to consider each letter and its meaning. Then students chose a letter of STEAM that they enjoy to embellish in a way that they would help convey its meaning to others. The resulting artworks are both informative and celebratory of the concepts they represent. Board C is kindergarten art. These are shape collages, two picture books prepared by the kindergarten artist for this project. The Shape of Things by Dale Ann Dodds and Mouse Shapes by Ellen Stoll Walsh. Walsh. Both stories help students think about how simple shapes can be used to combine create more complex shapes, designs, scenes, and everyday objects we recognize. Students then created the collages by adhering foam shapes to paper. Some students chose to draw on additional details. The resulting collages are fun, colorful, and insightful. Board D, oh, over there, I keep getting it wrong. <laughs> Painting with dots of color. Artists in K3 were introduced to the style of pointillism. In particular, the artist Georgia Surratt Students observed and discussed how colored dots appeared to be more than just dots when they overlap and begin to form shapes together. Students were then encouraged to explore painting a subject using only dots to see what kind of visual effects they could achieve. And finally, board E in the back, more kindergarten art, tape resist painting. Students looked at the work of LA-based LA contemporary artist Mark Bradford who manages large-scale paintings full of birds, paper, tape, string, paint, etc., that are both added on, collage, and eroded away, decollage. St kindergarten artists then had a gall gallery walk of the process of tape-resist painting and learned that tape can block or, or resist paint. To begin working on this multi-week art project, students first stuck pieces of masking tape over their papers that they either tore or cut with scissors they then painted over all of it with tempura paints. After the paintings dried, students removed the masking tape to re reveal clean white paper underneath. Most chose to refill that blank space with more color using markers, pencils, gel pens, cray and crayons. The results are, colors, are full of colors and textures that show time, the time and attention these artists put into these imaginative crea creations. Thank you to all the Dallin artists and to Stacy Greenland, the art teacher at Dallin, for this wonderful art for our room. All right, uh, is there anybody here for public comment? All right. <clears throat> yes, you are, go ahead. So uh, for public comment, uh, as you know, um, we have three minutes, and uh, please state your name at the beginning. Um, we typically do not respond to public comment because it needs to be a separate agenda item uh, to discuss. Go ahead and start when you're ready. My name is Deborah Savage. I'm here. 
You'll, you'll need to be by the microphone because we're televised. That's yours. That's mm -hmm. Okay. My name is Deborah Savage. I'm a parent. I represent a group called the Arlington Special Education Alliance, a group of special education parents in town. Um, I haven't been to the school committee for a while because um, we've been busy. We've been busy writing a report, a research report on the state of special education in Arlington, where we combined not only information from the lab report and little information from the regulatory compliance report by the state and a lot of crowdsourced information from parents to pull it all together in one place, create a framework and some strategic themes regarding special education in Arlington and assess where there's been progress and areas where there still needs to be progress. This report took us a lot longer to write than we thought because special ed's very complicated. <laughs> but the final draft chapters are out for review by parents and some experts, SPED experts. And the full report in the executive summary will be available by mid-February. So I brought in a draft summary of the findings and recommendations. We've been talking to, we've talked to almost 200 parents of special ed students over the last not quite two years. And a lot of it, the information in the report comes from them. Sorry I didn't bring multiple copies, but we did actually create a nice framework for understanding and reviewing the state of special education in Arlington. And then we've provided you with a series of tables with findings and recommendations. There were one, two, three, four, five, six areas where we feel like Arlington's making significant progress. A couple of general education areas where they're making progress, and these are gen ed initiatives where there's very clear links to special ed, but we found a huge number of areas of very high concern that per the currently available information, the district doesn't seem to be addressing adequately, and that's what this document outlines for you, and I'm guessing my three minutes are up. Close. You have so, 45 seconds if you, if you want. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, I, the, the list is too long to actually go over it in the time that I okay. have left, which is why I brought it in writing. Um, I'm hoping that Mr. Cardin, I do have an extra copy. I can give you two copies. Mm -hmm. You guys could reproduce and make sure, or if you want, I can email this out to the school committee if that's an easier way to do it. Probably, yeah. yes. Okay. Thank I you. will, here's my extra hard copy for whoever wants to take a look at it. You can pass it there or you can have it as the ADA rep. And um, I'll email it out to everyone else who needs a copy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is the update to the Arlington High School uh, Program of Studies. Uh, Mr. McCarthy and Mr. Dr. Jenger. Good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. Good evening. I believe everyone received a copy of the updates and changes through Ms. Fitzgerald. Yes. So I just wanted to go over very quickly some of the updates and changes uh, for the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, the first section, policy and general information updates. Uh, we changed all references to the guidance office to the school counseling office. That's been an update across um, in our system, as well as changing the physical education department to the wellness department, which reflects its updates in terms of uh, going beyond physical education and into nutrition, yoga, and other areas of wellness. Uh, to be more aligned with our inclusivity, we have removed uh, gender-specific pronouns throughout the program of studies, uh, replacing he or she, his and her, with they and them when appropriate. Uh, we've also updated the MCAS um, as part of the competency determination. Uh, if you look to the last page of that update, uh, the state has updated those scores and how they'll be scaling them. So we just want to make sure the program of studies reflects that. Uh, most of these changes will not impact the class of 2020. They will impact the class of 2021, which will be next year. 
Uh, very excited about some of the new courses we'll be offering. Uh, first of all, is there any questions about the policy or, or the updates? Okay. Um, some of the new courses we're going to be offering next year um, will be Gender and Society. That'll be through Social Studies. Um, that'll tie in uh, with our course on race and talk about gender equality. Uh, the PE courses, will, uh, wellness courses, will be updated with uh, personal fitness, recreational sports. Both of those courses uh, we're going to be offering in the mornings to uh, students who want to come in early and take a PE course. In much the same way, we now have the uh, chorus or the magical singers and the band for students that want to come in a little early and take advantage of that. Uh, we're also diversifying the science electives. We're setting up a new system now where some of our electives, uh, such as astronomy and oceanography, will rotate through. Uh, the idea being one year you'll have those two options, and the other year you'll have weather and climate and physiology of exercise and activity. And that way, over the course of your four years here, you're going to have a wider range of science electives. Uh, we'll also, with that in mind, we'll also be reactivating video game development and advanced robotics uh, as we make artificial intelligence with Python and JavaScript dormant for next year. We have several name changes, and that is just to reflect updates, whether that's the College Board with the AP course, uh, the AP Art course, or um, the choir being changed to Corral as well. I think I covered everything. I think you covered everything. Are there any questions? Mr. Hainer, the robotics, will that be part of a comp uh, state national competition thing? Is, that, is there a the thought robotics, of We have a robotics team, and right, I they compete against those folks, so there'll be overlap between the two. But. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Seuss? Uh, yeah, just a couple of questions. Uh, so one, dormant courses are just courses that are every other year. That's just sort of a sort of part of the regular schedule, is that right? Yep. Okay. Um, the gym classes, are they, um, do, can you get credit for them? Can you sort of fulfill your gym requirement with them? Or they, you can, okay. Yes. So it's sort of different than Magicals, right? Or Right. So right now we have, well, no, Magicals is actually for credit. Oh, it is? Okay. And Magicals can fulfill the fine arts requirement. Oh, yeah. Although it's usually hard to get in if you have Every, already done it. Everybody's had it. <laughs> right, by that point. I yeah, mean, okay. so the thinking behind that is we have the later start time. We already have a lot of kids who actually come in and, wait, um, and actually our PE department comes in and opens the weight room. Um, and they come in and do, um, what do they call it? Team sports. Personal fitness. Personal fits and this. Well, there's personal fitness and there's also... <clears throat> ping pong and all that sort of stuff, so the sports. Um, and when we look at the research on sleep time, we're moving things half an hour later, but there's also really good research on exercising before school. Yeah, sure. And, and there's a lot of good research different. on giving kids flex time. Sure. So the yeah. idea that some kids could come in and be able to use that time to get some exercise before the day starts um, seemed like a positive use of the time. And then finally, as a former philosophy professor, I was very excited to see that there were two philosophy courses offered. Um, there is a small mistake in there. You probably, um, other people have caught it as well, probably. The asterisk that belongs to the weather sort of got repeated on the two philosophy courses for the honors. Just to... I'm sorry, could you so, repeat um, that? So, so, for example, the introduction of philosophy says students will have the option of earning honors credit through more extensive weather sampling. <laughs> uh, and this, and that then, could be a philosophical it question. Be, it could be. <laughs> um, that would be the what. And then, and then the purely, uh, a totally extra comment. I've never heard that definition of philosophy. I think probably most philosophers would have the opposite definition of philosophy. But, but that was just intriguing to me. The um, uh, the study questions that we have to assume we know the answer to just to conduct our daily lives. I think most philosophers would say it's, it's the opposite. The opposite of? Well, that you would, I mean, that you just don't. Um, there are a bunch of things that you actually can conduct your, personal, your life without knowing the answer. Knowing the answer adds value and interest, and it's an examined life, but it's not. <laughs> uh, no, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> so we can all know that it's wrong to torture small children without knowing why it's wrong. Like, what's the underpinning of what makes it wrong? Which is a philosophical question. Yes, uh, so Marine, I, but Yeah, I mean, we can well, we can go back and take a look at that. Okay. Um, I believe the language, a lot of the, both of these courses arose out of MOOCs that were 
um, run in the past years, which is why we knew that there was student interest in them and why the teacher had experience teaching at the high school level. Um, I suspect this comes out of that, um, that curriculum, but um, it's always good with philosophers to try to get your language right so that you can Oh, add, absolutely. But they'll argue about it language. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the yeah. indulgence. The marine <laughs> biology class, does that require a prere prerequisite? Oh, which course, I'm sorry. The marine biology, do you have to have, have finished biology? I'm just asking, I, I have to be able to. Oh, for uh, oceanography? I thought you said, mentioned marine biology as a course. Did I miss uh, No, we, uh, we have weather and climate, physi physiology of exercise and activity. Okay. And those are for next year, and we have an oceanography course. Um, those uh, courses do not have a prerequisite. Okay. I misheard. My son's a marine biologist. That, that's maybe where I, I would love if there was a marine biologist. Well, they, they had it at, at his high school. They had it for four years. It was heavily subscribed to, and for whatever reason, they dropped it. They dropped it. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, Mr. Spring. Uh Would you uh, describe the uh, courses we are uh, saying goodbye to and, and the reasons? Of course. Um, show me this in front of me. Uh, so participation in government public policy uh, is an honors level course. Um, there's just been a lack of interest in that course. Um, it ran for two years mm -hmm. and hasn't built a following. Um, pep band and rock band both came out of our performing arts department. Mm -hmm. Our goal with the pep band was actually to um, build a band that would go to football games, basketball games, raise school spirits, um, and rock band, much like jazz, we were hoping to venture into a new venue of music. Um, both are being removed because of lack of interest. Mm -hmm. We usually end up with one or two students in both classes, which is not enough to run a band. And, and on both of them, so for the music department ones, one of the challenges is our musicians are already engaged. Mm -hmm. and so the question was if we could find students we could bring in. Um, and then with the participation in government, there are other related courses mm -hmm. that students are doing instead. It's not that we have no interest in government. Yeah. It's just that that class hasn't run. No, I, I, that's my assumption, but I'd just like to hear that. Of course. Mm -hmm. right. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, two questions. One, are you going to have some identification of the courses which are biannual or um, that you're going to be running every other year so that people can look at that and plan ahead. Mm -hmm. you know, so in, in the, is there going to be a description in the catalog? Mm -hmm. in the, well, in the program of studies, uh, we do mark off those courses <clears throat> when they become dormant. It's online and we've highlighted those courses. So they're marked that way. Uh, in addition, our, guidance our school counselors meet with each student. Um, and talk to them about, they're aware of what courses are becoming dormant and active, and they can work that out with the students uh, when they show interest. So the idea is, I think, as you were getting at, so that students can plan ahead, that they yes. think that will be offered next year. Yes, exactly. They will have that and, information. And, or even, you know, in two years, um, you know, not the, if they can't do it this cycle, they'll know right. to do their, you know, do something else next year and plan for it the year after. So, okay. Um, and then the other thing is just the table where you list the MCAS results and, and the, the uh, scores. Mm -hmm. um, the formatting is a little confusing to me. The last column that talks about subjects because there's lines and it, I think there's lines and there really shouldn't be lines. Mm -hmm. um, if those lines could disappear, it would become more clear, at least to me, um, because it looks like the next gen I read the whole row across you know partially meeting expectations applies to math and then the meeting expectations applies to ELA it's just confusing to me at least I can definitely make that edit okay thank you all right anything else all right can we get a motion to approve so move second any further discussion all right all those in favor all right. yes any opposed or abstentions? All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Benny Conklin and the History Social Studies Curriculum Presentation. Thanks, Rob. 
Uh, so good evening, everyone. It's great to see you. Uh, I want to preface just by um, expressing my thanks for the support over the past year um, through the additional FT at the high school. Uh, we'll talk about this in the presentation. We've been able to offer more electives than we ever have, and our enrollment is up. Um, and the best example of your support has been sitting next to me right here. This is Crystal Power, a former third grade teacher at Pierce Elementary, now our K through five social studies coach. Uh, so she's gonna spend some time talking about what she's been working on this year and where we're going. Um, but I feel like um, for the first time in my five years here in Arlington that our elementary school teachers are getting the support they need in order to teach social studies to um, the best of their abilities. Um, and then we also have um, Lucy Conroy, who is one of our eighth grade teachers, to talk a little bit about the new eighth grade civics curriculum this year that has been very, very exciting for our students to get engaged in. Uh, so I'm going to start off by um, handing things off to Crystal. Thank you, Denny. Um, first, I wanted to formally thank all of you for your role in establishing this position and your um, assistance with making that process happen. As I was preparing for this presentation and thinking about how I would express to you what exactly my role encompasses and um, why exactly social studies deserves this investment, I kept coming back to a quote from the National Council for Social Studies, which explores a little bit about what social studies helps students do. And I'm not going to read the whole quote, but I thought I would highlight some of the important aspects. Social studies helps students to understand and participate in their world. It helps them to explore relationships and it encourages productive problem solving. And I think that last part is the most important piece for us to consider for our students. Um, it, helps, it enables them to become responsible citizen, citizens who are ready for participation locally, nationally, and globally which for me ultimately comes down to the definition of what social studies is. We're mm -hmm. preparing our next generation of citizens. And I think it's important that we can agree we were hoping to help our children grow into caring, compassionate, curious problem solvers who are ready to act on a global level. So thank you for demonstrating your investment in the next generation, um, which comes down to what does a social studies coach do? It's a lot, and it's an evolving role. Um, it's a constantly evolving role that's going to change as our curriculum needs shifts, as the, as the teachers' needs shift. Uh, one of the most important things I've done this year is build relationships, which is not as easy as you think. Um, it's across the seven elementary schools, six grade levels, and the multiple administrative teams. But it's a really important step so that I can establish that trust so that they're ready to make the changes both to the curriculum and their instructional practices. Um, another aspect has been to facilitate, this will be ongoing as well, to facilitate and coordinate professional development, um, to advise and assist in the creation and impl implementation of common assessments for the grades, as well as the analysis of the data from them to inform teachers' instructional practices. And um, huge majority of the work right now is adapting curriculum. Um, in 2018, the history and social science practices were updated to also include standards for history and social science practice. And this was a 15 year long overdue revision. So we're dealing with a lot of revision needs, adapting curriculum, um, revising, and in some cases, creating new curriculum. Uh, to better align with these standards as well as district initiatives. So that leads us to my current workload. Um, we've been working with teachers for on professional development to help them better understand the social science practices. These are almost similar to the uh, math practice standards that many are familiar with. These are the thinking that people in history and social science, the disciplines, this is the type of thinking they'd, they would be uh, expected to show. For example, we've done some work with fifth grade teachers this year on analyzing sources related to the Boston Massacre and thinking about credibility of sources, corroborating evidence, and hoping to show them that this, these are the type of skills that we want our students to be showing. Um, we also have been piloting a, a common assessment in fifth grade, and I've been working with teams of teachers to understand the assessment, to administer the assessment, 
I'll be working with them to norm and score the assessments to ensure consistency across the Selvin Elementary Schools. And then we'll be meeting in teams to discuss the data to see how that can inform our practice and our curriculum moving forward. <coughs> First grade has been um, the vast majority of my curriculum building this year. Um, I'm really hoping to build a, a new scope and sequence out for first grade, which is pretty much done, um, that better reflects the 2018 standards. Um, I'm also hoping to integrate better technology such as Google Earth and create units that better reflect modern societies in North America and Africa than we currently use. One of my major goals has been around the creation of a unit on Africa that represents Africa as a continent versus a country and enables students to see the great diversity, ingenuity, innovation, and economic growth occurring there. Moving forward next year, and as long as this position's funded, hopefully, <laughs> um, we'll be piloting next year the new first grade curriculum units across the district. So I'll be working with teachers to understand the units and to understand the formative and summative assessments that are embedded within those. Uh, we'll be looking at the second and fourth grade curriculum to further revise there. In fifth grade, we're going to work on implementing or creating supplementary materials that will continue to work on, uh, continue to foster the development of historical thinking skills. I'm going to continue to work with teachers on professional development, um, fostering not only their understanding of the, the skills required within the discipline, but their background knowledge as well. And yes, I think I hit it all over <laughs> So that's been pretty much where we're going. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff just going on K through five. Um, one other thing I'll add on is that we also, this summer, to take the tools of my curriculum. And then we created civic supplements to help the kindergarten teachers um, introduce those civic skills to our kindergartners. Um, so it's been great having Crystal this year. It's reinvigorated my passion for all the elementary social study stuff. I'm so excited about everything that's going on. Feel free to ask questions. Very, very happy to talk about it. Um, at the secondary level, uh, we are continuing on with our district goal and our 6 through 12 department goal, working around research and research skills. Uh, so these are essential questions that I presented to you last year, and we're continuing on with these essential questions. Um, this was the plan that we had laid out in order to meet and answer those essential questions. Uh, so the text in white, you can see, are things that we had accomplished last year. Um, the text in yellow are the things that we're working on this year. <clears throat> Um, one of the biggest things we accomplished is we established a set of research skill focuses in grades 6 through 12. Um, so we divided up categories of research skills that we want students to have, such as gathering evidence, organizing evidence, presenting their evidence, um, and then, well, really grades 6 through 11, because 11th grade is the last required history course. Uh, we've laid out what we specifically want each student to be able to do by the end of that grade. Um, so with that in mind, we're creating common assessments and common activities, um, lessons uh, where students can practice these skills. I was really excited going into one of the sixth grade classes at Gibbs. One of their skills that they're working on in sixth grade is how to just do a search, which I think we take for granted. Um, but they're learning how to do advanced Google searches. They're learning how to narrow down their keywords. Uh, most importantly, they're learning to go past the first page of search results which research shows that I think 80% of people never go past the first page of search results. Uh, so it makes me excited that we're giving students really good skills to uh, participate in society. Uh, so we're gonna continue on with this goal um, throughout the rest of this year. This is just an example of what that skill chart that I mentioned earlier looks like. Uh, it's just a screenshot that illustrates sixth, seventh, and eighth grade and the skills that teachers have outlined for the work in these grades. Um, so that's the big 6 through 12 initiative. I'll talk a little bit more about high school um, in a moment. Uh, but now a great update on our new 8th grade civics course, Power, People, and Progress. Like I said, we have Lucy Conroy here. Uh, fortunately, one of our teachers, we wanted to have everybody here, but one of our teachers had death in the family, one's in grad school, and one's coaching. Um, but we got Lucy, and that's all we need. Oh, oh my God. Oh, Lucy was the first choice, I thought. <laughs> Oh, thank you, and it's great to be here tonight, and we're so excited about this curriculum. So I know the last time we were here, we were talking about what we were going to be doing, and now we're actually doing it. 
and the kids are amazing. They're so just, it's just amazing what the students have been doing, what they're interested in. Um, so um, I know you have the curriculum, but some, some of the things that we're focusing on, of course, is, and what's so amazing about this curriculum is that we're, things are actually happening in real time that we could talk about. So when we're you know, obviously talking about the powers of Congress and impeachment, we're talking about it like day by day, what's happening, and the students can tell you like who the house managers are and what their job is. And um, so it's very exciting. Um, I think the other piece is just sort of picking up on the research skills, um, just to sort of give an example, students as we're studying, you know, sort of the branches of government, you know, for, for um, from our perspective, we want them to have the foundation, but also to be able to apply that as active citizens. So it's sort of that balance of having, really understanding the Constitution and also then being able to apply that. Um, so just as an example, students, um, studied, of course, like just sort of how a bill becomes a law and did some research using the Senate website, the House of Representatives website, used this piece of it called Bill Tracker where they can um, research an issue, then find a piece of legislation having to do with the, the issue that they are interested in, and then the follow-up was writing a letter to a congressperson about that issue. So it wasn't just writing about the issue, but actually being able to go back and identify a piece of legislation where it was, what committee it was in, what the status of it was, and then be able to follow up by asking for action. Um, so, and it was tremendous what the students did. And we had some, we have so many fantastic materials, so models for students to look at, and just really, you know, even learning how to write a, a, a very effective letter, proofreading it, um, and then we're gonna be mailing them this weekend to the various reps and senators. So um, it's just an example of kind of how we're piecing together, again, sort of the, um, the content, the, the skills, and then the, okay, as a citizen, what am I actually gonna do about this? There's so many things I can talk about. Uh, yeah, so much to talk about. I mean, I've been amazed in my observations of seeing some of these things. Recently, I was watching, or I was in the classrooms reading through their um, project they did where they created third parties. It was fascinating to see students in groups conferring and thinking about the ideas that they could take from the current two major parties that we have and their own goals for society. Um, and I was reading through these, I was like, this would be a great idea for a party. Like, why can't, we should have this political party. Um, so it's really, really exciting. It, make, it really does make me feel optimistic about this generation and the ideas that they're bouncing back and forth. Uh, one of the other lessons that I really loved, too, was um, thinking about the roots of American democracy in the Iroquois Confederacy, um, thinking about the legacy of Native peoples and the fact that a lot of the ideas for government we've taken from Native peoples, uh, which I think is really important as well. Um, from the teacher perspective, uh, we've had a lot of time to meet and plan. Uh, Brian Maringer, the principal of Audison, is here tonight. He's been great in arranging time and coverage so that the eighth grade teachers could have a lot of in-service time and professional development. Uh, some of the big successes so far have been student engagement. Uh, the second one is huge for eighth graders, respectful, mature discussions. Uh, I think that for the past couple of years, I've come out and I've said, if we can allow our children in the town to be able to um, engage in civil discourse, that's the best skill we can give these kids. Uh, so a couple weeks ago, I was in the classroom and students were doing an agree-disagree um, activity about the statement, the government that governs least is best. And it was just wonderful hearing the students say, well, I don't really agree with you with what you said when you said this because, uh, but I agree, blah, 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 blah. Um, so just hearing the students be able to have those conversations in a calm way has been also very, very encouraging as well. Um, as Lucy mentioned, there's been a lot of great opportunities to connect to current events. Uh, the challenges uh, have been there are so many resources. I think with the new civics curriculum, every textbook company, organization, they are just bombarding myself and the eighth grade teachers with resources. Um, so distilling which resources we think are the best for using with students, um, resources that we can use to differentiate instruction has been a little bit challenging at times. Um, another big challenge is that every district has done something a little different with the eighth grade civics. 
Um, so it makes it hard to kind of have conversations with other districts and other eighth grade teachers about this course when there's a lot of variation right now as this course comes into maturity. I have to give credit to Arlington because we rolled out this civics course this year. There are a lot of districts that have not done that yet. Um, so we're kind of ahead of the game with that, um, which is really awesome as well. Other things. Yeah, so we have had, again, you just with the first year, so many different kinds of activities, um, you know, games, um, the projects, some of the uh, projects, the letter writing that I just um, explained to you. Um, I think students are very um, enthusiastic, I mean, beyond enthusiastic about expressing their viewpoints on the issues and truly care about what's going on in the community, what's happening in the country, what's happening in the world. So they're constantly looking for opportunities to um, express their ideas, actually do something about the ideas. And I think a lot of our job is, is sort of just guiding that energy. Um, but like Denny said, I'm so encouraged by these students. It's just amazing um, to see how much they do care and how anxious they are to take action on their ideas. Um, they're not really cynical, um, and that's wonderful. So we're sort of building on that. And I think at this age, they are very um, open and excited and want to actually again, take action on um, a lot of these issues. So um, again, you know, we're sort of doing different types of things. We're trying a lot of things as well. And collaboratively, we, you know, we meet um, every, um, every day in the cycle, every, every week, you know, we have a four-day week but, um, in the cycle, but meet and sort of compare ideas. Well, there's a lot of the things we're doing sort of exactly the same, and there are other things that we're trying, and then seeing how is that working out. Are we going to do it again? Are we going to not try it next year? So that gives us a chance to see kind of what's working and what's not working as well. And don't take our word for it. <laughs> this is what the students have actually said. So we went in and we just grabbed some quotes from students and their reflections so far about what they're finding this year. Uh, so you have the presentation, uh, so you can read through these on their own. I love that a student brought up gerrymandering um, because it's great that <clears throat> eighth graders now that know what gerrymandering is. Uh, so thinking a little bit about what is still ahead in the civics course. So our next unit is on state and local government, and then um, racial equality, women's equality, immigration, equality for everyone, and then finally our civics action project um, as we get towards the end of the year. But all of these, um, with this curriculum, everything has, is building throughout the whole year. So it's not like we're going to introduce <coughs> racial equality and, and we haven't talked about it. We've already talked about the you know, 13th, 14th amendments to the Constitution and just everything is building and then coming back to it and then looking at if there's stuff happening currently with it, then we bring that in. So, um, but we have specific units set up for this, but again, kind of laying it out over the course of the year and building. Um, yeah. So we'll be looking forward to seeing the Civic Action Project that's part of the state requirement um, in the new civics law for eighth graders to complete some sort of civic action project, as well as for another civics project to be com completed at the high school level, which we've been rolling out this year as well. Um, so maybe next year we can talk a little bit more about some of those projects. Um, in terms of things that are going on at the high school, um, our big curriculum work has been in ninth grade this year with our Modern World History course. Uh, we had a really open, honest conversation at the beginning of the year with the modern world history teachers. Our question was, what do students really need to know about modern world history in order to understand why the world is the way it is? And previous to this, modern world history had kind of been a slog through the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, chronological, through the big history, a lot of it European focused. Um, and I have to give props to the ninth grade teachers that have been working like crazy this year to essentially do a new curriculum. Uh, they started a year with many units on learning about the United Nations, the European Union, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, we've added brand new units on conflict in the modern, modern Middle East. Um, even before the events of this year unfolded, they had planned a unit on Iran to understand Iran, and then it just kind of paid off that all these developments have happened um, in current events. Modern China, modern Russia, modern Africa, and then thinking about migration patterns um, in Latin America. So it's been very, very exciting to see teachers dive into this new curriculum and see the connections that students are making. Um, our focus in US 1 this year 
has been incorporating more of the history of Native peoples. Um, and we've made a very concerted effort in US-1 to not just talk about Native peoples when they were moved to another place and when they were you know, subjugated and when their culture was taken away from them, but really, as we mentioned earlier with the Iroquois Confederacy, showing the positive ways that they have been part of the American narrative and the American story. Um, we had new courses this year. We offered a brand new course uh, through Syracuse University on personal finance, a uh, new course called Social History Through Sports, and another new AP course called, uh, which is on human geography. Uh, next year, pending the approval, but I guess now approved, we're excited to add the gender and society class to have students begin to think about um, notions of gender identity and the role that gender has played in people's interactions throughout history. And to close out, because we love data and to, as a tribute to Matt Coleman and the math department, here are some statistics and numbers for you. Um, last year, we had 246 students take uh, history, social sciences, AP exams. 78% scored three or above, 58% scored four or above. Um, this current school year, our department enrollment is up 5% from last year. Uh, we're about 106% enrolled, which is significant knowing that there is no senior history requirement. So to know that more students are taking history courses their senior year, and some students are doubling up on their history courses and history electives is significant. Uh, the statistic that always jumps out to me this year is that our AP enrollment this year is up 19%. Uh, so last year we had 279 <coughs> students taking AP courses in the history department. This year we have 333. Um, so I think that says a lot about students and their willingness to challenge themselves, as well as our ability to widen and diversify our AP offerings. Um, so that is all the good stuff that we've been doing for this year. Again, we appreciate your support in the department. Um, and now if we can answer any questions you might have, we're very happy to do so. Sure, Mr. Hainer. I just wanna say, I think it's great doing modern history. Uh, all the way through my high school and college, we never got to beyond when I was born in 1945. It was ancient stuff and it, it's real. It, it makes it real and I think it's great putting it in the ninth grade. Uh, you can go back from that point, but they, they know you care. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, thank you very much for this. It's really helpful. Um, the civics course, uh, the eighth grade, sounds really interesting. And I was wondering, do you ever, because this is a new course, because it's rolling out across the entire state, are there ever opportunities to talk to other eighth grade teachers in other towns? You have to compare, we're doing this, this is how, you know, we thought this worked really nicely. Um, you know, just things, it seems like everybody's doing the same thing. Wouldn't it be nice to? Yeah, so in the from... summer we did a workshop, so we had, you know, again, it was before, of course, mm -hmm. before we rolled out the curriculum, but we, there was a lot of comparing about where, um, uh, schools had already done it, what worked, what didn't work. The people, folks running the workshops were experienced teachers who had taught it at the middle school level before, so we were able to share ideas that worked and didn't. And it actually helped us think about how to start the year, which was probably we wouldn't have decided to start the year the way we did unless we had talked to experienced eighth grade teachers who had done it before and advised kind of how to roll it out. Um, Ongoing, of course, we do professional development through like primary source and things like that. So in that way, we connect with other folks. Um, but there really isn't probably like a more structured way currently that we're meeting with other eighth grade teachers. Okay. A very robust email chain between all the history department heads in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so we're constantly talking about how our districts are dealing with various challenges relating to the curriculum and history and social studies in general. Okay, thank you. Uh, super excited. Um, just sounds, I've been excited for years, frankly, about what's going on in the history department. I just think there's just, there's just so much energy and excitement and reorganizing, of, of rethinking things, which is just great. I'm excited to hear that the Africa curriculum is getting more robust and more interesting than it. Um, certainly excited about the civics. I'm excited that state and local government is going to be talked about next. Um, you know, our state rep represents 40,000 people. In Arlington, the town meeting member represents about 2,000 people. So you can actually access these representatives and you know talk to them and influence them and you know convince them of something. And and so it's really it's it's more maybe more accessible sometimes than the the people over there. Um, anyway, just super excited. <laughs> Mr. Thielman. 
Are you going to trademark uh, Arlington Runs on History? You gonna... <laughs> <laughs> no, I need to trademark this. When I taught in Framingham, I had a logo that was similar about Framingham uh, Runs on History. Yeah. <laughs> and one year, I had to a parent that worked for Dunkin' Donuts. Oh. Um, but she, she thought it was funny. Everything can be covered under that, like, oh, it's for, if it's for education, it's fine. Uh, so. Okay. so I do have some, uh, quick questions. Uh, so the world history curriculum that you had in eighth grade, that now is going to happen in high school? Or what's, this, what's the plan? That's a great question, and something actually that the history department heads throughout the state have been talking a lot about. Uh, we don't really know where that is going as of now. Um, in ninth grade, we think we're going to have to do a little bit of a crash course at the beginning to catch up on some of the big things to help students understand the curriculum. Um, but it's interesting that the state put this new civics course in eighth grade but never said where that other content should go. Uh, they Surprise. made a loose recommendation for four years of required history, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon uh, just because we love our senior electives that we offer to students. Um, so we're trying to find ways. I think next year will be a very interesting year for our ninth grade teachers to see if there's any difference um, in the students' background knowledge and contextual knowledge when they come in. Uh, we might find out that there is, and then we'll figure out what are the things that we need to focus on. Uh, we might find out that there isn't. Um, I mean, I love the Protestant Reformation as much as the next person. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really exciting to get this current relevant history that students can immediately see themselves in. Uh, so the, TBD. Let them take a college elective. And, um, another question, I mean, uh, I, I'm excited about the civics curriculum. Th those are big topics. So I mean, you know, immigration is, you know, that's that's a big topic. That's you got to understand a lot about history, history of the country. Um, I just wondered how, how much, like, how much the teachers must have put a lot, a lot of time into like figuring out how to teach this topic because you've got to frame it and you've got to do a lot of research and then you've got to present it to the kids and give them enough context so they can have an intelligent conversation about this stuff. So, I mean, like, you know, immigration is, right. you know, there are, in law schools, there's about 10 courses on it now. So, <clears throat> I don't know. I just want to know how you approach all these big topics. Yeah. No, I think, it, you know, it varies, but I think a lot of it is, is driven by the students, you know, because we're, you know, give, you know, for example, we might give them options of something to research and they're generating their, um, you know, their interests. I mean, even just getting back to this sort of looking at Congress, picking issues and then getting that sort of energy to, and I'm going to research every part of this. And uh -huh. so I think that's, that's a big piece is sort of what's coming from them and, and how we structure so um, they can sort of initiate that process. And so they can go to a primary source and learn about like whatever. So, well, I think, yeah, and we provide the materials yeah. and then they can, you know, um, so engage with it, but I, I think in terms of presenting stuff, I feel like you know we we sort of present the structure, and but a lot of it is getting them to engage in research yeah. and research and then bring them back in. So because for a history teacher, you, there's a lot to research. Is like there's a lot to research in this in this civic curriculum, yes. the yeah. civics curriculum. Yeah, yeah. and then it, and and we have so many materials. So with this curriculum, we have so many materials that are accessible for eighth graders. And to be honest, compared to the previous curriculum, which was great, but was really hard to find materials for eighth grade mm. level mm. world history. The civics curriculum has a ton available mm. and at a lot of different reading levels. So we can kids can access the material actually much better. It's, it's surprising what's out there that's actually very accessible for this age group. So in that respect, it's, um, there's a lot more out there that they can engage with that they could, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know we're, not, we're not looking at like a college textbook necessarily of everything on immigration. There's stuff out there that's sort of already kind of put together for an eighth grade audience. All right, thank you. I, I, I'm excited about the new curriculum. I do miss the castles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work with you. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk about the old days, you and I. <laughs> we got 50 states now. <laughs> yeah, I, I went. To, I was a junior in high school at the time of the 1968 election, and those were turbulent <laughs> times as well. Uh, I, I think that we're now engaged in as, as turbulent a time as we were then. <coughs> it's, uh, an interesting time to be teaching high school um, civics and history. 
my question is more academic, though, because I'm, I'm thinking about what's going on in the elementary level, and I know that there has to be collaboration with the literacy folks because of the uh, focus on informational text and, and, and writing. So a brief uh, mention of uh, how, how that interchange is working. Um, in many of the elementary classrooms, they're using the, the Lucy Calkins curriculum, the mm -hmm. reading curriculums and the writing curriculums, mm -hmm. which fully align with a lot of the history practice standards, asking students to think about perspectives in reading, for example, mm -hmm. asking students to create an opinion-based piece of writing using evidence and examples. So it mm -hmm. supports a lot of the work that we're doing. Uh, and for, with a lot of the Lucy Calkins units, however, there's a fidelity that's needed to the curriculum and to the resources. Mm -hmm. So many of our former integrated units mm -hmm. are starting to fall apart a little bit mm -hmm. um, and moving toward a shift more toward social studies. Mm -hmm. So in the creation of a lot of the units now, and we're also dealing with a lot of old topics, for example, where the current curriculum has us exploring Africa through folk tales and exploring Mexico through folk tales. So trying to create something that's more modern, and a lot of it's basing our, basing our social studies time on reading and reading skills and writing skills, and we're ignoring some of the practice skills here. So we're looking at a variety of ways to create units that teachers can teach social studies and those skills, which will also fully integrate their writing skills and look at other, their reading skills and being able to interpret and analyze evidence. And then my usual bottom line question, we're a policy uh, and budget organization. Uh, what do we need to know what, uh, to support your work? Um, I mean, at this point, what would the continued support towards our curriculum resources and materials has been great. Professional development funds have been great. Um, I think that I would always argue for another social studies coach. Uh, Crystal's doing a fantastic job this year. But as she mentioned, having seven different elementary schools with mm -hmm. all those grades is a daunting task. Um, and I'm still continuing to try to do a lot of work specifically in fourth and fifth grade. Um, but inevitably, just teachers aren't necessarily getting the support that they need. Um, so with everything Crystal's done this year, she hasn't been able to do as much in second grade, doesn't, hasn't really touched third grade. Um, so I think that we could ensure better equity by having an additional social studies coach to help split up some of that work. Um, I know how much reading is a priority for the district right now, um, but I think that in the social studies department, we continue to come back to the research that supports that, uh, that supports that increased reading comprehension comes through having better background knowledge, having better contextual information. Um, so we see ourselves as a department helping to further and contribute towards that district goal. Um, so while social studies, an additional social studies coach might not look um, like it's going to translate into different reading scores, we believe that it is. Uh, Crystal spent a lot of time this year doing some uh, additional research on the connection between um, high quality social studies instruction for students um, as, and uh, reading comprehension. I don't think it's all about reading scores. I, well, but the, my, my, the, the finding that I have is because it is not one of the areas that is tested and I'm glad it isn't because when they've dabbled with MCAS tests on social studies or history they've become trivia games rather than meaningful uh, thought experiments. Uh, but because of that there's less attention traditionally in a lot of places across the state to social studies as opposed to the other four content areas. And I want to make sure that, you know, that we're providing the history and the civics and the, in, in the uh, quality instruction that we need to be doing K-12 to so that we have great engaged citizens uh, uh, to go out into the world. Yeah, definitely. If we could just extend the elementary school day by like another hour, <laughs> that would be good. That, so that, that, much, that, you know, it's by, by decree, right? <laughs> Well, we thought we'd begin the union negotiations, so here we are. <laughs> um, all right, my question. Oh, say comment. I have mm -hmm. one question. Okay, um, so the civic action project. What what what, would, what does that look like for the eighth graders? Yep. Um, talk. Yeah. So we're looking at basically students researching an issue of concern in the community and um, then developing a project and 
some an action project around that idea. Um, so one of my colleagues has had a lot more experience with like Generation Citizen and actually doing these types of projects in seventh grade, um, Eric Backey. And so he's gonna sort of help us a lot, I think, with how we're gonna actually design that. So this year, again, of course, first year going through, um, we're um, gonna, our plans to begin sort of that process in February. And um, I think that, you know, a couple ideas. One, again, is it being student generated in terms of each student individually choosing what it is, you know, sort of what their focus is going to be. And hopefully at this point in the year two students will have had enough experience with research and with sort of um, um, understanding kind of how things work that they're going to actually be able to design a, have an idea and actually design a project that is something that's doable and we have the, sort of the right people involved. That at the high school level, we're currently in the middle of a lot of our civic action projects right now. Uh, so as um, Bill McCarthy had said, we're not running that public policy course anymore because a lot of it is embedded now within these uh, projects. So our 10th graders are researching public policy issues, local public policy issues. Um, I would expect that as school committee members, you're going to get tapped into. Uh, part of it is having them interview players and stakeholders. Um, I know we have some really interesting projects right now um, about whether or not we should require doctor's notes to excuse absences, and students are researching the connection between that um, and various equity issues. We have a group of students researching whether or not the Arlington police should wear body cameras. Uh, so they're really looking at a very micro level at local stuff, which is great. Great. Thank you. Dr. McNeil? I just want to thank uh, Mr. Conklin and Crystal for their work at the elementary level, and Lucy and all the you know, social studies teachers throughout the district who have you know, adapted to the uh, new curriculum standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've just done, done a great job of integrating this and um, infusing it into our instruction so it's not overwhelming for teachers. So they've done a great job, and it all has to do with Mr. Conklin's leadership. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> Okay, next up is uh, Arlington Community Education uh, Summer Fun Update. Ms. Rothenberg. Let me just pull this. Can you pull the window up on the? We sent the presentation as a PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. You should be able to do fit. Okay. We will wing it. That's fine. I think I can control it from here. Nope. I cannot. Okay. Nope. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Thank you for having us. I'm Jen Rothenberg. I'm the director of Arlington Community Education. And I'm Andrea Loeb. I'm the youth programs manager for Arlington Community Education. And we are happy to be here for our annual update. Um, we, it's, this is our busiest month right now. We just launched our winter programming last week. Uh, we sent our summer fun catalog to the printer yesterday, and our spring catalog uh, wraps up tomorrow. Uh, so we are incredibly busy right now, uh, and, but it's a, it's a really exciting time for us. Um, so I noticed that the agenda says that this is a summer fun update, but we sort of, we absolutely think of community education as 
full programming. We program year round uh, and we serve really kindergartners through adult seniors and we offer enrichment programs. <coughs> Our goals are always this, the same, which is just to provide solid programming for all age groups. Uh, we're very proud to be a part of the community. Uh, and if, and if, I know you have trouble parking on the nights we have classes, <laughs> but if you've walked through the hallways, you've probably seen you know, the 40 people doing line dancing in the cafeteria and mm -hmm. uh, the, the ukulele players and language students, knitting, cooking, you name it. Um, so uh, you probably have felt their energy in the building on Thursday nights. Sorry you can't see all of these. Look, there are the words. So here's, our, here's the heads of all of our staff members. Um, I guess I'd like to start. That's our former director, Donna Itson. Um, I would just like to take a minute um, and acknowledge Donna. She retired back officially back in 2016 um, when I took over as a director, um, but uh, she stayed on as a consultant until just last spring. Donna took over the program in 2005, and it was a tiny little two-sided piece of paper with some programs that happened here in the evenings. Um, she slowly grew it over her 10-year period as the director. She added the Summer Fund Program and Kids Zone, uh, and we are incredibly grateful for the organization that she left to us, and we wish her the best. Um, you know, if you bump into her on a mountainside or on her sailboat, thank her because um, we are very grateful. Um, so since we last came in, we have added one new full-time staff member. So we have, um, there are their legs. Um, so <laughs> there we have three full-time staff members, four part-time staff members, and then we have a couple of folks who help us in the evenings um, who uh, are with us uh, year-round. Um, in addition, we have um, I, so for spring term, for example, uh, the adult programming only, I'm working with about 130 individual instructors just to create our adult programs. Uh, Andrea works, she has about 60 youth instructors per term. Uh, about 30 of those are Arlington Public School teachers. Uh, this summer in 2020, she's going to have about 62 Arlington Public School teachers working in our summer fund program of which Crystal is one of them. Uh, we have eight elementary on-site coordinators, so there's a coordinator at every school. We hire lots of high school students to help us with our culinary programs, and uh, front desk and staff, Manjot is one of our superstars. Um, in addition, uh, we have about 50 uh, high school students who we work with during the summer program. And we also participate in the high school internship program. All right. Um, so on the youth side, uh, these are the programs that we offer for K to 12, uh, most of which are continuing to grow. Uh, enrollments were up about 7% um, last year, uh, over last year for Kids Zone and Teen Zone, and Summer Fund saw a 15% increase in enrollments last summer over the prior summer. Um, can you flip this? Yep. As for highlights in high school, one of the uh, exciting developments we've had here is that we've started working with the guidance counselors and the English department who have teamed up to offer a college boot camp, uh, application boot camp for the rising seniors. We started that last summer. We had a good response. Uh, they get one-on-one, -on -one, uh, small group attention with writing their essay, working on the Common App. So they're going to continue with us this summer. We're going to do expand to two sessions, and we hope to see that grow. Um, we also like to focus on general life skills for high schoolers, such as financial literacy, self-defense, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, for Teen Zone and Kid Zone. Um, New for Kid Zone, last winter we launched a partnership with Arlington Center for the Arts. We were very excited about that. We're bringing in 
um, some of their arts educators uh, to offer three to four classes every term in the elementary schools. We're continuing our partnership with Arlington Children's Theater to do the same. The, their teachers come into the schools after, after hours. Um, and we've heard from parents for many years that they want keyboarding, keyboarding, keyboarding. We are now um, up to five schools. We're hoping to get that to all seven. So that's grades three to five. Chess is hugely popular. We offer that Tuesday early release. And then at the middle school, this fall we started a class called Things You Should Know, which is a how to adult class. Okay. And we got a very good response, so we expanded to Audison. So we actually have, we're gonna run that this winter at both, both schools. Um, those are early release three hour workshops. So we're hoping to continue with that. Um, challenges for the high school. Um, General engagement, we, we, we love to engage the students and the teachers. We invite them to our uh, lectures and special events, uh, give them free entrance. Um, and some come, we'd like to see more, of course. Um, for kids' zone, space is um, always a frustration. Uh, you know, a victim of our own success, right, for everybody. Uh, we, we come up against the after school uh, programs to try to find space. We are finding more and more of our programs fill, filling up immediately and with big wait lists. So we're turning families away, um, many of whom seem to need the extra hour after school. Uh, we could probably double our programming, but space is really our only, only, um, only thing holding us back. And just to add to that, many of the students who are in the after school programs at the elementary schools also participate in our programs. So they pulled from their program to do the enrichment class and then they're brought back. So there's a, there's a demand for the families who need just an extra hour, but clearly the students who are in those other classes, in, in the after school program, the students who are in the after school programs, the, the families are wanting them to also participate and uh, in whatever chess or uh, language classes that are being offered. So there, I think the demand is there. I, I, I do wish we had more access to spaces. Uh, and as Andrea said, we could definitely double our programming in those schools if, um, you know, to help some of the families who are not in after school. Um, vacation fund, we're still offering. This is a smaller version of summer fund. This is, uh, we're not seeing as much growth here as we'd like. So we're continuing to an analyze whether or not we want to continue, especially April, which is quite small. Um, we are doing it uh, next month in February, and we are committed to April this year. But we'll see what uh, see what the numbers look like. Summer Fun, of course, is our largest program, uh, and it's continuing to grow. We have, uh, let's see. It's all, I, we always describe it as a pop-up elementary school. It's 350 to 450 kids a day going into Audison. We have 25 plus uh, classes in the morning and the afternoon. We hired 62 Arlington staff this year. We have, um, I, it's really exciting. We open registration on February 12th. Uh, of the 3,000 seats we offer for the summer, one third of those will sell out in 20 minutes. So it's really exciting to see. Uh, parents start calling in November for the schedule. So uh, we're bringing back uh, Christine Fanchulo, who's a Thompson uh, teacher, and Christine Capaldo from Bishop. They're going to serve as our full-time on-site directors again. They were excellent the last two years. Uh, and we're very proud of our counselor program that we've expanded. So last year we hired 50 Arlington High School kids. Uh, and we did a, a combination of pay and volunteer hours, and we did a formalized training and evaluations and um, interview process. So we'll continue that. We think that there will be more and more demand for that, and we'll probably have to start turning kids away. Um, but we're proud of that. Anything to add on? Okay. And then summer fun challenges. Uh, of course, with growth, uh, the air conditioning is always a drag, uh, and parking. We don't need to tell you that. Uh, especially with the, the young families, we have 300 families coming in 
and trying to drop off their sometimes six-year-olds with little kids in tow. Uh, everybody is looking forward to moving the program to the high school eventually. <laughs> Parents will be thrilled. Uh, but we, we, we do pretty well at Audison. Uh, we, we've purchased some portable air conditioning units. They take the edge off. They're not great, but they help. Um, and I think that's it. Okay, so in terms of adult pro programmings, our, our uh, program has continued to grow. So since uh, over the last year, we've increased enrollments by about 10%. Um, we are expanding our offerings. We now have a new speaker series with local author Steve Almond, uh, and we collaborate with Kickstand Cafe, and we have some very interesting topics that engage the community. We've had a packed house the last couple of times, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we offer uh, expanded daytime and weekend programs. We're partnering now with local businesses and organizations in a different way than we have in the past. Uh, we are we're increasing those relationships. We're currently in, you know, we drive up and down Mass Ave. We're in all the libraries. We're in fitness and yoga studios. We're in the flower shops running classes. We're, um, we're all over the place. We are also partnering this spring with the Arlington Education Foundation um, Julie Dunn brought to us uh, the program for the youth mental health first aid cert certification. Uh, so that program is actually going to be run through us um, with the support of uh, funding from the AEF. We're able to offer that at a very low rate. Uh, so we're excited to do that. Um, we also have added new this year a uh, trip this spring to Italy. We're partnering with uh, Marie Radowowski, Rad. Uh, and EF, and so we're running a trip. We have about 20 uh, adults registered for that program. Um, this spring, we're going to be offering day trips for adults. Uh, they'll most likely be over the weekend to places like Vermont uh, <coughs> for foliage trips and the Berkshires for history. So um, we continue to expand, and obviously, the more program we can do outside the building for the next five years, probably the better. Um, one of the challenges that, um, I wish you could see that picture, one of the challenges that we're facing right now is that the central school is, uh, as you probably all know, about to undergo major renovations starting in April. And we, uh, we actually do the programming for the Council on Aging. We've been doing that for years. So the, the way that we have worked it is that um, they don't have to hire a programmer at the council, and we do the we set up all the classes for them, and they allow us to use the space for free. Uh, so we have about uh, that's better. Thank you. We have about 20 classes that we run during the day, uh, throughout the week, and uh, because we've already had to plan our spring programming, we've had to scramble to find new spaces for those classes. Uh, and we now have to pay rent in all of those spaces. So that is a big budget uh, concern for us. Uh, so that, it, that is something that's probably going to last for about 18 months. That's what the estimated rebuild is. Um, and on a smaller scale, it kind of gives us a little taste of what's to come with the high school rebuild. Um, Thank you. So mm -hmm. we, I think um, we obviously have a lot of concerns about the rebuild. Um, we have been working very closely with Bill McCarthy and, and Dr. Janger just uh, in terms of the planning and the scheduling, and I'm very grateful for that because we do have to plan so far in advance. Um, now that spring is done, we're about to start, we have to start thinking about fall. Uh, and we know that with the renovation starting, changes happening in the front of the building in March, um, that's, that will affect us greatly. Uh, the, just trying to get our students into the building at night, we probably have 300 students that come in at night for classes, 
and making sure that they're safe, that everything is ADA accessible, they have places to park. Um, those are all top on our list right now. Um, the, uh, the parking right now is a, is a problem, as you all know, but especially in the front of the building, they're able to park on Mass Ave and they can kind of fan out into the neighborhoods. Once th that area starts to close down and access is limited, and we have uh, our students trying to park in the back, there's, even though there will be expanded parking lots, it won't be quite enough. And so our concerns are that our students are gonna just decide not to take classes with us. Uh, so uh, as we move into the interior renovations and we start losing Old Hall and the kitchens and the wood shop, it's really going to change the types of programs that we can offer to students. Um, but we're continuing to build our relations within the school and around town. Uh, we have come up with, we're d trying to devise a plan B, which uh, ha we've worked with Dr. Bodie um, and Brian Maringer about the possibility of potentially splitting our programming in the evening and doing some of the programming at Audison and some at Gibbs at night. Um, obviously, that doubles all of our expenses. It means twice the staff, twice the custodial. Um, and so we're not sure how that's going to play out in the end. Um, we're certainly entering into an uncertain time. Our goal is to maintain the same level of programming that we've been able to maintain. Um, but we're concerned about being able to keep our students engaged. And, uh, but as Andrea said, we know they're all just as excited as we are about the possibility of the, this new building and moving into the new building. So I think that's all we have right now. But um, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Ms. Seuss. Uh, so what, one is a comment um, about the adult programs. One of the comments I heard years ago is that people were frustrated there weren't enough things during the day, enough things for older adults, and I think there's been a, a tremendous amount of, you know, huge amounts of offerings that, that we've seen in the last few years, and that's great, and I've, I've heard that from the community. Um, question, about how many people, adults, do you serve a year? Or, or I mean, I know some people take more than one class, but I'm just some curious people, what the numbers so, look like. Uh, in the fall, this past fall, mm -hmm. we had uh, about 2,100 distinct students so that's one term got it so okay. we have obviously those some of those students will take classes in the winter and the right, spring right. there are a lot of repeats um, and as you say uh, those students will take multiple classes but so mm -hmm. you we have three adult terms a year right okay so great uh, be because one of the things we talked about when we were talking about the high school is how much the high school is very much community resource at the heart of Burlington, it's really it serves the entire community. It's not obviously the most important thing is students, but it, it really is a community resource. A um, couple more questions: um, the uh, for the youth programs for the space needs. So I know when we talk to the after school programs, there's issues about um, accreditation, and you know certain rooms have to be accredited in certain ways. Um, most of what you're using is classroom space. Is that right? So I, I was just wondering, what are, are the challenges that we have teachers who are working late, putting up things in their classroom, and then don't want to give up that classroom space? Is there accessibility issues? I'm just sort of curious about what. Um, classrooms are pretty good except for Tuesdays when the teachers are there, which is right. when they, we have the most demand, of course. Right. It's the extra spaces. So if we want to do a robust art program, the art room, mm. Uh, right. Gym programs are very limited. There's yes. only probably school one programs. school where we can use the gym. Got it. And we have, you know, kids. We could get a hundred kids who want to take a karate class easily. Right. Um, so it's the swing spaces. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Dr. Allison Ampey. So thank you. This is really great to hear each year, and it's amazing how much it's been increasing um, over time. Uh, one. Specific question, just thinking ahead as we start site work, are there any classes held by um, community ed in the high school over the summer, either during the day or in the evening? Mm -hmm. uh, we do have our driver's ed program scheduled. We have three weeks during, during July and August that we'll be running, and those classes run Monday through Friday, 9 
3.30 to 3.30. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have other classes that would meet here, but we have moved them out. Uh, Except we do have the uh, ACT, uh, SAT prep we will have, right. and then the boot camp we had mentioned earlier. So some of the high school programming, there are just three, three or four classes that are scheduled to still happen here. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I mean, just congratulations. This is really amazing yeah. growth since yeah. this started thank you. Yeah, a long time ago. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So um, I want to add my congratulations. It's been it's a terrific program. I mean, in the, the 17, 18 years I've lived here, it's really, like you said, changed from a one sheet to a really robust, similar to you know, Cambridge and other really well-established programs. That's, that's a great credit to you and your staff. Um, as, as far as contingency planning, it's great that you're Sounds like you're on the ball and, and, and doing all that. I mean, you do have reserve funds that will hopefully enable, enable you to get through with a lot of the extra expenses that you're, you're um, uh, encountering. Um, I, th I think within the next 12 months, we'd like to see a plan for, for that. Mm -hmm. There is a, a significant balance that you're sitting on. So we understand that you need that for contingency purposes. But at some point, we need to see what, what, what's, what's going to happen with that money. So Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. Our next item is collaborative problem solving, Dr. Janger. <clears throat> it says program solving. Collaborative. Oh. Get the typo, yes. What does it say? Ross, pro collaborative program solving. <laughs> Did not proof the agenda. Take the percentage down. So that is our new program in hacking. We're going to like, you know, write the curriculum together. All right. Great. You know, those annoying programs, they're gone. So, so as I understand, I have 15 minutes. I have an hour and a half long presentation here. Um, it's a summary of a three-day training, um, not to mention the evaluation of its outcomes. So I will do this in, so I meant to look at my clock. I'm going to grab a clock here. But I will do this in 15 minutes. We'll try for 10. So forgive me if I'm going fast. Um, one of the things I really have noticed about collaborative problem solving is that we start with the philosophy because understanding kind of why, why you're thinking about what it is you're doing is the most important part. But one of the big challenges is the elevator pitch. The 30-second elevator pitch, which we practice doing, doesn't really do it justice because it sounds kind of like common sense. And so you have to think about why it's not common sense and why it's not what we do and why doing it with rigor matters. So I'm going to back up for a second. Let's go to the next slide um, and talk a little bit about you can somebody's got to advance. I have a clicker? Oh, even better. Um, OK, I'll go to the next slide. Maybe. Is the, is, does he have it into? There we go. No. Nope. Wrong button. You broke it. One more time. OK. Um, so collaborative problem solving is an evidence-based approach for helping students with behavioral challenges. And what we mean by behavioral challenges is when students' behavior does not meet our expectations, right? And that's a wide range of things that can be defined as behavioral challenges. And it's based on the fundamental concept that kids lack the skill, not the will, to behave well. And I'll talk more about that later, but that you focuses instead of on motivating students to do what you want, giving them the skills to be able to be successful. And then the point about that is that students need, that schools need skills to develop that, as well as processes and organization, because we're not necessarily structured in order to achieve those goals all throughout the building. So how did we get here? Um, if you go back a couple of years, actually about three years, we have had in this district for as long as I've been here um, goals around equity, goals around social emotional learning, and goals around closing the achievement gap and improving student engagement. Those have been important goals. And we've done a lot of experimentation and a lot of research with many different approaches for more positive discipline, for different ways to engage kids, for ways to teach skills. And we try those. The way we work in the high school is People work and they, you know, they do research on those things, they bring them in, they see how they work in our context, they see whether they can apply. We do small research in PLCs or in the student study team, um, and then we think about which of those things are most effective. 
So going back two years, we found that collaborative problem solving was one that we were having a lot of success with in very small amounts, and so we began a more rich pilot. So two years ago, we had all of the student study team, all the counselors, all the social workers, all the deans, do at least some initial training, and then 13 folks did a full that three-day training I talk about to get Tier 1 trained. And we began to try to implement that with students in that context. And I was really surprised at how successful we were and how much buy-in we got. You know, if you think about a dean, your life is to deal with challenging students on a pretty regular basis, and it is certainly a lot easier to be efficient to say, you do that again, you're in trouble, you did it now, you're banged out of class for three days. We don't like suspension, but it's a very efficient way of dealing things, except for the fact that then they come back and you keep dealing with them over and over again. And very quickly, the deans and the, the counselors and the sub-separate programs that were being trained in this came back really positive about it. So we trained a larger group of people the second year. Um, we were working with Mass General Hospital, who is the main trainer in this. They have really great measures. So we did metrics of, of, class, of school readiness, um, of school understanding of the concept, of school buy-in to the concept, and one of my favorites, of teacher burnout. Because the idea is you don't want to implement a new program in a school unless people understand and buy into the philosophy, people um, are open to sort of in learning those skills, and they're not burnt out, right? If everybody's up to their head with other things, then you're not going to be able to implement those new things. And one of my favorite things about this program has been their emphasis on that because it's one of the things we often forget about in our desire to do everything for everyone. Um, <clears throat> so the second year we decided we still needed to build our capacity so we piloted their training modem. So we had this group of folks that had been tier one trained did online training with their coaches twice a month over the full year in order to improve our own approach. We also did some more training with the staff and then we ran the readiness survey again. Um, I will say that if I sort of had my druthers, I might have waited another year and done some more building of the capacity of the training group in the building. But with the new construction coming, remember burnout and capacity, um, it really seemed like, and the new start time as well, it really seemed like the time to roll that out was this year. So this year, um, we did something which is pretty ambitious, which is we reorganized the schedule in order to create training time so that every teacher could receive 16 hours of training. Um, Mass General Hospital, when they talked to us about full implementation, where you train everybody in a program, most of the juvenile justice, most of the uh, behavioral programs, most of the student detention programs in Massachusetts operated using this approach. There are a lot of larger schools that do it elsewhere in the country, but none in Massachusetts. But their approach was, they said, it's really very simple. Everyone in the school does three days of training, and then we coach them once a week. And I laughed. I said, we don't do three days of training in public school. We'd have to pay everybody to do that. Um, it would be prohibitively expensive and negotiated and impossible. So they've really adjusted their own training. They're doing it, piloting it in two schools in Massachusetts so that they can do this biweekly training throughout the year. Um, so every staff member in rotating groups is receiving coaching. Um, and then there are team leaders who track the students, who report back to the student study team to help coordinate to make sure people know what's going on. Um, a group of us has been tier two trained and some folks are going on to get certified. Um, if you click on, is there any way I can click on that link? It opens for us. They have a very sophisticated program evaluation, which I will come back and talk about at another time. But one of the wonderful things about working with MGH on this is if you think about our typical program evaluation, what we do is dose the whole school with some general treatment or conversation. And then we look at a sort of vaguely related outcome, like I've done with many of my discipline presentations. We did CPS, and the outcome was fewer suspensions, when in fact we know that there were 100 other things that contributed to the fewer suspensions. And so what they're trying to look at is tracking who is being trained in what, who is changing their behavior about what, what students have been dosed in terms of actually participating in Plan B conversations, and then what kind of outcomes we have. So it's a pretty rich evaluation. We're at the mid-year point. They're just going through the data, and I'll have a better idea of that going forward. So you can go back to the slides. Um, so let me go very quickly through the philosophy. So as I said, the idea here is that kids do well if they can. And the difference of that is versus kids do well if they want to. 
So kids do well if they can sounds like a perfectly reasonable idea. But, and the idea is that if they can't, something is getting in the way and our job is to figure it out, right? And the good news is they like to say is with our help they can do better. The current practice, and let's really think about this because we say it all the time and we wrote our program, our student handbook around it, and we have lots of conversations about this, is that kids learn to use challenging behavior to get things, right? He's trying to make me mad. He wants to get out of class. Um, and what we need to do is make them want to. So if a student is late to class, we give them detention. And if they're late to class again, we give them a longer detention. And we keep ratcheting up the pain until they decide they'd rather come to class. Um, and the thing about that is it works for kids who can come to school on time. The useful thing about these sorts of things is you make them want to. You motivate compliant behavior with rewards and punishments. Or, and there's the other option, you just lower the expectation. He's not going to come if I keep giving detentions. I'll just let him come in late. Right, please come on time, Johnny. Um, and then they just work with that. Um, the challenge of that is that they do teach basic lessons, they do motivate students, but they don't teach complex thinking skills. And for students who know how to do it, they realize, oh, he really wants me to come on time. I don't want that, I'll come on time. For a lot of our students, coming on time is possible. They understand why they need to do it, so they do. But for the ones who you're in your third long late detention, they already know they're supposed to come on time, they already don't want a detention, and mm -hmm. they still come late. And so then there's a lot of problems because it breaks the relationship, it makes anger around them. We know that when you suspend kids out of school for bad things, it makes them fall behind, it breaks the relationship, and it tends to lead to worse outcomes. So the impact of reward and punishment is less intrinsic motivation because we tell the kids, you're doing this because I make you. Right? One of the things I say to the students a lot of the time um, is that one of the worst things we do in public schools, in school in general, is that we require you to come because it tells you that you wouldn't come if you didn't want to, if you, if you had a choice. When in fact we know that they would. But people make sense of things based on what we do. It increases a fixed mindset. It decreases growth. And, and this is important, punishment also dysregulates kids. When you do research on kids who really got blown up, You'll look back and you'll say it wasn't their initial behavior. They didn't walk into class and get blown up. They walked into class and did something that was problematic. And someone said to them, now you're in trouble. You get this consequence. And then they really blew up. Right? If you don't do this, you're going to have this happen. And they really blow up. So the unconventional wisdom, the point they're making, is that it's a learning disability. And if you think about it as a learning disability, it really changes the way you feel about your responsibility. Right, if you remember back 20 years ago, um, 25, I don't know how long this came along, maybe 30, 40 years ago, people thought that kids who couldn't read were dumb or weren't trying. And it turned out that an awful lot of them had a specific learning disability. And if you taught them in a different way, they could learn to read. And it would be malpractice for our current elementary school teachers to treat students in that way. And we know that the result has been we've gone from 75% graduation rates to 98% graduation rates. And we've had 75% graduation rates where a lot of kids couldn't read to everybody being able to read to at least a basic standard. So the point is that kids do well if they can, not if they want to. So I'm going to jump fast past that. Their basic point, and this is really kind of a very interesting way to think about it, is there are really only three things that you can do with kids who don't meet their expectations. Actually, with anybody who doesn't meet your expectations, you can say, do it or else. That's plan A, which stands for adult. You can not make them do it. And we do that a lot of the time, right? We say, this kid's going to get too anxious if they do this, so we're just not going to make them do it because it's going to dysregulate them. It's going to cause them to disengage. It may lead to bad behavior. Um, one of the sort of comments that they make, which I find really helpful in school, is that schools tend to think of themselves as being designed, divided between the plan Ayers and the plan Seers. The plan Ayers are the teachers who think to themselves, if I did not hold to the standard, this whole place would fall apart. And the plan Seers are the people like me who say, is there anything you can do for Johnny? And then they say, I'm being asked to lower this expectation. And the two of those things are important, but they don't in the end achieve the goals that we have, which is plan B both collaboratively problem solve with the student to find solutions that are durable and meet both people's needs. Um, and it's easier, it's easier said than done. And most of us, and this is the biggest challenge in a place like Garlington, we don't have that many kids who are disruptive and our teachers are pretty much kind of almost doing this already. 
right? The challenge is actually not for Arlington that our teachers don't buy into this, but that the need, it doesn't feel as urgent, but for the students who struggle, it is. And learning how to do it with rigor is really important. And so what do the plans do? And this is what they call the gold standard. Plan A meets expectations. It forces kids to do what you want them to do, right? Or it puts them somewhere else. Plan C reduces challenging behavior. But only plan B meets expectations, reduces challenging behavior, builds skills, durably solves the problem, and builds a helping relationship. And one of the things you realize if you're going to develop skills, new skills, if you've got anxiety, you don't just remove all the triggers. You give small doses of the stress in a safe environment in order to get people better at it. If someone is cognitively inflexible, you don't simply make it so that they never have changes in their routine. What you do is you give them small changes in an environment that's safe with people that they trust. That's the way we get stronger at things. So, and now I'm gonna go really fast through this. In order to do this thoughtfully, what they really want you to do is think about with the big issues. Sometimes you do it on the fly. There's spontaneous plan B, there's emergency plan B, but this is proactive plan B, which is what you want to be doing. You want to think about what's going on. There are three lists. What are the challenging behaviors? We start there, you know why? Because that's what makes us crazy, and we need to write them down so we feel better, and then we set them over to the side, because what they really help us identify is what the problems to be solved are. And the problems to be solved are when the challenging behaviors occur, because challenging situations plus lagging skills lead to challenging behaviors. And so what we want to identify is when those problems happen. Is this a laser pointer? Oh, it is. Yeah, but see what happens when I hit the laser pointer? Start it. You broke it. I got all excited that I could point. Why does the laser pointer set it out? Why does it set it back to the out of presentation mode? I get there real fast. All right. So that's the basic idea there. And what we're trying to work on, there's a large poster of it over there that fell down that I'll put up for your next meeting, <coughs> is these cognitive thinking skills. And it's really helpful for us to think more, more clearly about this is the situation in which these challenging behaviors happen, and so these are the things we're working on. And the nice thing about doing this is it doesn't actually really matter if you get it exactly right, because what you need to do is start the conversation where the student can identify and have practice at doing the things that they're challenged by. So this is the plan B conversation. Okay, there are three stages, empathize, share, and collaborate. The most important phase is the first, because the first thing you want to do is get yourself and the student regulated. You can't solve problems, you can't get kids to develop new skills until they and you are calm. If you are dysregulated, and I have this problem with my children, if you are dysregulated, you cannot regulate someone else, right? So you've got to be calm when you go in and you've got to stay calm. And then what you're doing is you're saying to them, here's the situation in which you seem to have a challenge. Let's talk about this. You don't talk about what the behavior is. You don't talk about the consequences. And so there's four pieces to that, right? Um, reassurance, who usually should probably be at the top, and then clarifying questions, educated guesses. And you work with the student to bring out their concerns. And what you find, of course, is when you do that, that process builds cognitive flexibility. It builds trusting relationships. It builds the skills. And then and only then do you move on to sharing the adult concern. And practicing doing this in a structured way is what we really are working on with the <clears throat> teachers. Um, and one of the things that's really amazing is that you, you'll look at pe the challenging situations that people have. So sometimes you will look at a teacher who says, well, I do this. And so, and really, again, most of our teachers are trying to understand the students and work with them. But teachers will have an unexpected situation where they said something very nice and supportive to the student and they blew up. And if you look back, what you realize is that really thinking hard about how you introduce the concept and how you reassure and where you move. When I look back at the sort of conversations that went wrong with students that I was trying to have supportive conversations with, when you really start to be coached on this, you realize, oh yeah, Right, I, I, I went straight to the, the challenging behavior. You know, hey Johnny, uh, I know you're, you're upset about this and I realize that I probably should be saying you're doing a good job more often when you're playing this game. And the kid's like, that's not the issue. Why are you thinking that's the issue? And then we get into an argument because now I've come up with the solution 
and I've sort of started to look at it, and it's more complicated, and what has to happen is that the kid needs to talk about it. It's also incredibly valuable, we find, for me as an administrator, especially in my role, I find that what I do is I invite parents who come to me with a concern about a teacher to have a conversation where the teacher and the student do plan B, and we sit in the room, and I facilitate. Because really, in the end, the only people who are going to solve a relationship problem between a teacher and a student are the teacher and the student. And the parent gets to watch their child build those skills, which builds skills for them, builds understanding of what we do, and is really positive. All right, so what has that done? We've already talked more about this. That's my old presentation. I've updated a little bit the numbers on this. But if you look at our discipline trends, since we've been doing this, we see a 55% drop over two years. And if you look over the last two years at a comparison of what those things are about, you'll see that we have this increase in substances, but conflict, there's 32 conflict and disruption related things. Um, and last year, they dropped to 15. So those dropped by half. Um, and one of the things I talked about before, sort of where there's a conflict directly with a staff member, which is sort of an area we have control over, there were three two years ago. There was one last year, and I know just from the incidents, that in the first three, they really were sort of escalated conversations with the staff. And it's not that anybody did anything wrong. Staff handled it very well and appropriately the way they had been trained, but they were situations that escalated. Um, and we find that we just don't having those as much. And the one that happened last year really was not escalated by the staff. It was escalated by the time the staff got there. So um, it was really different. Um, so the evaluation. Where is that going? So right now, we've done a big mid-year evaluation did in November with the teachers. And it's promising, but not perfect. Um, as I would have expected, we've seen a really strong move in teachers' understanding and buying into the philosophy. That was really positive. Um, in terms of applicability of the skills, of feeling like they kind of could bring them into the classroom, um, the feedback was good but not great. The people at MGH were said, we don't usually get that low numbers. We're a little disappointed. And I think that has a lot to do with the modality of doing this online in small groups um, because you don't have people here. Um, so we're going to continue to the end of the year, but next year we're really going to switch over to smaller in-person trainings and trainings with everybody else because you really need to work with people who are on the ground with you working with the kids. So as I said, the philosophy and understanding is high. The application is moderate. Um, and if you look over the last three years, you see a steady movement in people looking, feeling like we have the capacity to do this, buying into the philosophy, feeling like it has a positive impact, and burnout stays even. Now, I'd like to see burnout going down because one of the goals is to increase teacher job satisfaction and sense of efficacy. So we're working on that. Um, so that is the end of my... Uh, presentation. If anybody wants copies of the School Discipline Fix, which is Dr. Avon's book, I have a few extra downstairs. I'm happy to send them up to you. I meant to bring them up. Um, there's a few folks that work on this, and there's some, a lot of really good resources out there. The Think Kids website is full of videos, trainings, online things, tons of information. So if you're interested in learning more there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hainer, you want to start? Is there any thought of doing something similar with the parents? to help them develop the skills to support you folks? So to train students in CPS? Well, it's, it's to communicate, you're working on communication with the, the students and, and the teachers to avoid the conflicts and, and, or to deal with them and things of this nature. It doesn't exist in isolation. I mean, so s CPS is actually very much a, an approach that is taught for parents and parenting. Okay. I will tell you that as a person who's been doing it for three years and feels pretty good at it, I can't do it with my own kids, so I haven't quite figured out how that works. Because <laughs> okay. um, I get dysregulated. Okay. Um, I can appreciate it. But, that. but um, I, we would be very open to bringing the training in at this point, it's sort of within our capacity to do things. And we, um, I did a presentation at November 1st at the training that Dr. McNeil organized, um, which was wonderful. And I had a full house for elementary school teachers. Um, and we had a little bit more time than this, so we did some practice with it. Um, and so I'm a pretty strong proponent of it and think it can be really effective. I would love to roll it out to parents. Thank you. Ms. Seuss? Okay. Um, yeah, actually, I have uh, Stuart Applin's book on my night that I haven't read it yet. <laughs> but I'm very excited, too, and I've been looking forward to it. Um, so just to get a sense of um, 
a little bit of understanding of what you've done so far. I know you plan to do some more stuff next year. Is that the end of the initiative, with the exception of new faculty members, new, new teachers, or is there a, a longer process? Just so to get we sense would of what like to build like? out to you know having trainers who are trained within the school <coughs> so that we can maintain this. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, five or six people who are tier two trained right now. A couple of those are going on to get certified. That doesn't make you a trainer yet. Mm -hmm. um, Mr., uh, Mr. McKnight, who's one of the deans, actually went um, and presented at their training conference with all their trainers. Um, and I think he's pretty excited about moving forward on it. I would be excited, but I, then I saw how much time it took. Um, we'll have another crew of people tier two trained probably over the summer. Um, people, we talked about doing it. There is a training coming up for tier two, but um, the people who you want to do it don't want to miss three days of school in the middle of the year. So um, we'll train people over the summer. But the plan would be, if we're going to keep maintaining it with fidelity, to have a cohort of at least three people, because somebody's going to get a new job, mm -hmm. who are able to be doing training in-house to keep on training new staff as they come in, and then to coach people. Part of the thinking for next year, so we've used the X block this year to do the rotating training, mm -hmm. which has... Uh, the X block has been great as a resource to students and teachers when they're not doing training, mm -hmm. um, and it's been helpful to have that time to do the training, but it's a lot, right? It's still one more thing for teachers to do. So next year with the new start time and the way we're planning on doing it, which I'll send you a memo on eventually, um, we're thinking that we'll keep the X block as a 40 minute period and people will be able to do plan B conversations there with support from the folks that are better at doing them. Because the teachers, I mean, we want the teachers to understand the philosophy. They're not likely to be the experts. Um, the teachers in the sub-separate classrooms have been, most of them, more heavily trained. And those teachers actually do represent some of the experts. Hmm. So we want to keep, we want to continue to roll it out next year to put it in place and, you know, so it's reflected in the handbook, reflected in structures. We have a really great student study team. We do not have what are called teacher assistance teams very well structured in the high school. So if a teacher is struggling with a student or there's a group of teachers struggling with a student, it's really challenging for us to get together and have that conversation about how do we collectively support the students across classes. Um, people do it by running around a lot and having lots of little conversations. And so we'd really like to structure that in. And CPS really becomes the core of that. Mm -hmm. One more. Sorry. Um, I'd love to see it uh, rolled out actually to the middle school because I think one of the things that happened with our family is I kept going to the middle school teacher saying, our kid doesn't know how to do this X. And they said, well, she's not coming to see me, so I don't care. <laughs> right? right? So it was, like, it was like I kept saying, she needs these skills and, you know, you need to keep, you know, you need to, to train her in this way. Um, and I think there was, at that time, it was a few years ago, there was underappreciation of um, skill building. And I will say, level to level, I mean, so CP, CPS is something you can do K through 12. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in the district, right, they're doing a responsive classroom at the elementary school, which is, you know, they, they are friendly approaches, right? They, they, are, they are consistent with each other in basic philosophy. They all do it slightly differently. Um, I'll, I got into a debate accidentally recently with someone about positive behavioral intervention and support. but. It's like a conversation between Belgium and the Netherlands, right? They're they're friendly neighbors. They're not um, they're not problematic, and so I think it's really a rich conversation right now to be trying both of those and thinking about how they fit in together. Um, so I know the, the middle school is working on a lot of those things, and I'd be happy to work with them on CPS. But I also respect that they're also doing a lot of other work that's related to that. <coughs> Mr. Tillman, you actually answered my question. The question was how was this? How can this be maintained? How many? people have been trained so far in the school? Like what percentage of the staff have been? Well, the entire staff is current, will be tier one trained at, by the end of the year. By the end of the year. Yeah. Um, currently, there are 25 people who are tier one trained and have had coaching. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey? I had the same question about whether it should be moving down to the middle school. Mm -hmm. um, so that was answered. Thank I'd say you. yes, but it's not my boat. So okay. <laughs> um, and then my other question was just thinking about, so what happens if the child, you're trying to have one of these conversations and the child won't talk to you. So you get um, what's called dissociative compliance a fair amount. They say what they think you want to hear so you'll go away, right? Um, and depending on how challenging the behavior is and how significant the lagging skills are, sometimes you only get through empathy. 
right? So you have the conversation with the kid, you empathize with the kid, they actually hear that you're hearing them. They don't believe it, no one's ever done that before and they don't know the solution or the problem. Um, and it sort of went through a little bit of practice on our own part to realize, okay, I've spent my 10 minutes on this. You don't just keep going around and around. That helps you to build the helping relationship. The kid has an opportunity of learning how not to be dysregulated when you talk about this um, and to reflect upon it, and then you move on. And so sometimes you have to go back many, many times. Like the big finding for us was, you know, it's not a magic bullet. You've got a student, by the time they get to high school, the more challenging behaviors are heavily learned and substantive significant lagging skills. And so it takes a while to build those relationships to start to move beyond. Um, so, you know, that's the way it works. And sometimes, uh, one thing that's important to understand is collaborative problem solving is not just plan B. Collaborative problem solving is plan A, B, and C used thoughtfully as part of a plan. So you create a behavioral intervention plan. Sometimes, you know, the deans will sit down in our meeting, we'll talk about a kid, and somebody will say, oh, I think it's time for a little plan A. Right? Like the reality is some things are unacceptable and some things cannot be left. So, you know, you look, sit down with a kid, and it's like, okay, look, you can't bring drugs to school. If you bring drugs to school, we're going to throw you out. Right? You can't bring drugs to school. This, there are great CPS approaches to drug treatment, but we're not a drug treatment center. Right, so that's not what we do CPS for in the high school. You know, when you come back and you're working to be supported in sort of managing the things that you used to manage with drugs, then we'll involve in plan B conversation with you. And the same thing is true also, there are some things where we have to say, while we're working on this, we're not working on this. And part of what you really hope for in terms of the communication is that that behavioral intervention plan which goes out to teachers, their understanding like, oh yeah, that, that's not gonna happen. Right? Mm -hmm. This is what we're working on, and we're going to let this go for now. Mm -hmm. But that it's, it's not just this kid doesn't have to come to class on time. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like we're going to be a little loose on this because we're working on that. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Ablon tells a story about giving this presentation to the New York City School Police Department, and he said they were not listening very well. They were like, this is dumb, namby-pamby, silly, liberal stuff. We're not going to do it. And he said he went out afterwards, and one of the guys walked up to them, the head of the SWAT team, and said, you don't understand. That behavior is dangerous, right? It is not okay, and it needs to stop. And Dr. Avalon went back the next day and started his meeting by saying, let's be clear. <laughs> this behavior is dangerous. It is not okay, and it needs to stop. And then they were all like, yay, right? And then they were on board because there are some things that are, need to not happen, mm -hmm. right? And we're not going to have a conversation about those things. We still have to address those things with Plan A. I just want to uh, join in in the um, cheers for the program in that there's a certain need in the district for consistency in that a, a unifying theme that blends our elementary approach and our high school approach that unites in the middle level I think is essential so that my message to the district administration is, is if this is the discussion and setting we're using to build uh, social emotional learning uh, among our students at the high school, it only makes sense to bring it down to meet what we're doing at the elementary so that we're consistent and unified in our approach across the district. I, I would say from a medical model point of view, we are at the point in the clinical trials where we are very strongly positive, mm -hmm. but not at the point in the clinical trials where I would say to everybody else, you should stop your experiment and take my medication. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think one of the really positive things right now is that everybody's still working at their level on how these things work. But, there, but for a district, you know, you're, you're bringing in kids from, into ninth grade who are coming from our eighth grade, and we've, it's the transition years that are always the toughest. And if the expectations and the methodology and the systems and the way of thinking and the language is consistent throughout our stream, it makes it easier for, the, for our children and it makes it easy for, easier for all concerned to deal with the struggles of transition. Oh, yeah, no, I agree 100%. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I won't talk about another district where I work except to say that every time we change the level, the problems expand and that the disparities in our suspension rates expand because 
supports and relationships that a child may have and may need desperately in a building when they move up to the next building are all gone and they're building, uh, building up from scratch. And to have some sort of a systemic approach where something is in common for that eighth grader moving up to ninth uh, is really critical to reducing the suspension rate and reducing the incidents that, that re require intervention on the part of the staff. Uh, well, thank you for presenting. This is wonderful work that you've been doing. Um, I was just searching to see how much information you had given parents about this, and it, there, was some, there was some mention of a parent's coffee where you discussed it. But, um, you know, one thing that Kristen does really, DeFrancisco did, did really well was sort of like to promote responsive classroom and, you know, endlessly, because all of this stuff is very confusing for parents unless they've read one of these books. So I would encourage you to do a little bit more, you know, uh, newsletter or whatever to parents about what you've accomplished, where you're going, or very briefly what this is, where they can get, read more. I think it might be helpful. So there was a write-up that went out in the opening letter. I'm just, okay. you know, so, yeah. so in the letter that went out in the summer, there is a description of it at, yeah. at the parent orientations or talk about it. I'm just having yeah. talked about it at the coffee. Um, I do think we are due for a write-up that goes out to people to try to explain it. Um, and I will certainly send something out. I'm actually waiting till I get the... Uh, the better, yeah. Well, the, in a few weeks, we've got our first term discipline data. Ah. And so um, I'm hoping we see something positive. I will say, as I said to you last time, um, we've had a little bit of a... We continue to have a rise in, in the pos drug possessions in the school, which is an issue. Um, and. So it takes, it's, it's a little, unfortunately, you can't just wave your hands over the big number um, yeah. in order to sort of explain it, so. Great, great. Thank you. Dr. McDale. So I would like to applaud Dr. Janger for devising a way to roll this out and develop the professional development that needs to take place in order to integrate this into the high school because it's not an easy task. So in order to do that, you know, it takes a lot of thought and strategic planning. So mm -hmm. great job. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, next up, uh, Ms. Elmer and the lab report update. don't have to keep going back and forth and jumping up. I'll just sit here so I can mm -hmm. control the presentation sure. okay. as well. That works for everybody. Um, so uh, just to point out to uh, Dr. Seuss, I know you had asked for a presentation also on inclusion, given yes. the scope of this and your request to have um, presentations within 15 minutes, we decided that we would do a later presentation and hopefully bring in um, both our consultant on co-teaching and perhaps the consultant on what we're doing with reading, um, so later. So just okay. don't want you to be disappointed that I didn't cover what you wanted. Um, so just to review for folks, we had a, the program evaluation uh, took place in um, October 2017. Um, a team of external evaluators, two evaluators were on site. They did um, observations, they interviewed staff, um, did a record review. They issued a report in 2018, um, of which I shared the findings with you in September of 2018, and then last um, June, we did a second presentation on the implementation of um, those recommendations. The report itself um, issued 33 findings, which fell into the broad categories um, that we've defined as pre-referral, multi-tiered systems of support, teacher assistance, co-teaching, and inclusion. IEP development and evaluation and communication internal processes. Um, as I mentioned, we had shared those largely the first time we presented, so tonight I was going to focus on the recommendation and explanations. They broke each finding down. They followed with recommendations in the following areas. Just trying to see what the color looks like for you. Um, so I can read them so people can see it at home. Student support team processes, co-teaching model of instruction, 
professional development, team meetings, assigning of teacher assistants, administrative transition practices, evidence-based practice, program development, entrance and exit guidelines, program and staffing oversight. Um, for each of those recommendations, the report went on to offer explanations that were intended to kind of explain the recommendation. Um, they included an appendix, um, which were additional recommendations for the sub-separate programs. Um, they were given the scope and the time for the evaluation, with the focus was on inclusionary practices. They did not get to speak with um, substantially separate uh, staff or review the records or any programs related to the, uh, or any materials related to the program. So that's why it was included in an appendix, because it was not what they actually observed or um, evaluated. So in the Novus, you have an accompanying spreadsheet uh, where I attempted to break down the recommendations and explanations. It's 109 lines. So I was trying to find a way to capture it here in a PowerPoint. Um, so I'm just going to pause and ask how you would like me to proceed. Just to be aware, it came out on 102 pages where page 1 and page 51 are the same page. In other yeah, words, I don't, it, it, cut, it cut a page off. So you, you either got to reduce it, it, it's next to impossible to read. Yeah. Yeah, so I shared it um, with Mrs. Tassoni. She can probably share with you. She probably made it into a PDF versus uh, an Excel sheet. Um, so that breaks down each individual one. I don't think we have time to go through each of those individually. Um, I don't yeah, know so I, you, yeah. You so I think it. going through your slides is fine. Mm -hmm. We need to get the Excel file sent to us so we yeah. can print right. it on like legal size paper or at least look at it on our screen. We yeah. can't even look at it intelligently right. on our screen. So yeah. it, it, I mean, if you yeah. want to, no, no, it gives the technology Excel. issues. Don't convert it. Yeah. Okay, don't convert it. Just don't send convert the Excel. It. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I've broken down the recommendations um, for student support team processes. Um, they had two broad recommendations uh, around more uniform practice throughout the district, aligned with what they're referring to as RTI. Um, the state, for those of you who know, have, um, are moving to a model of multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, RTI, or response to intervention, can exist within a framework of MTSS. Um, they <coughs> tend to use the language interchangeably, so I just think it's noteworthy for you when you see those terms. They're using them interchangeably. We don't. Um, as well as SST. Um, so they kind of interchange those three terms. Um, and that the district needs to continue efforts that have been in place. Um, last June, I mentioned I sh that I had shared some action steps on the spreadsheet that you're unable to read. You can see both what we did in last school year and what we are continuing to do this year. So some of this is a repeat from what you saw in June um, around. Um, they recommend creating a binder. We have a shared uh, electronic resource for the materials and protocols, as well as we've sent a district-wide team um, to the state's MTSS Institute um, in September, and that same team will be going next month to the follow-up two-day institute. Um, we also had another team that went to the Systemic Student Support, or S3 Academy, that was sponsored by the De DESE, but run by Boston College and the Rennie Center, and that was a year-long um, group that we worked with around um, systemic student supports, um, specifically to address SST. Um, there were recommendations around gathering and sharing of data. Um, the reviewers didn't ask for the data at the time, so um, refer referral source and eligibility determinations, that information is shared annually um, with administrators. Um, we also applied for a school climate transformation grant, which was similar to the success grant that uh, the district had received about five or six years ago. It was a large nat uh, federal grant. Uh, unfortunately, we did not receive it, um, though we scored really well. We, did, we were not selected. However, that also outlines several of the proposed actions regarding MTSS that the district is taking. And uh, last year, as well as this year, we're continuing in a data-wise training. DataWise is from um, Harvard University. Um, Teachers 21 has been working with both district administrators, reading specialists, and then we also have a program for teachers who elect to take the um, course after school, and we've been running that for two years as well uh, around um, 
using the data cycle to do root cause analyses, problem solve, test your hypotheses, uh, whatnot. So we've been continuing to do that. Um, I know, Mr. Cardin, you were interested in the budget implications for a number of these recommendations. Um, I'm focusing solely on the request that you're seeing this year. Um, the recommendations uh, for the student support team largely, again, call for district-wide initiatives to align practices across buildings. Um, Sarah Bird, the director of SE, uh, school counseling and SEL, has been doing a lot of that work, but she has that dual role of also being the head of guidance. And so last year you saw a request for a lead counselor. This year um, you'll see a request for an assistant director so that she can focus more of that role in a district-wide capacity rather than um, just being focused on the middle and high school guidance departments. And elementary assistant principals. Um, the report calls for administrative presence during this process, you know, building a uh, team at the building level leadership around this and given the singular role of the elementary principal, it's really currently not possible for them to be at student support teams at, you know, each time that they're happening, grade level team meetings, doing building operations and whatnot. So um, that request, you see that request for elementary assistant principals. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, the co-teaching only because I mentioned that we're going to um, do another presentation on that. However, the recommendations around uh, co-teaching uh, focused on the essentially the um, inconsistencies between the levels um, where we have it at Gibbs, Audison, and the high school. And so the recommendation is to establish a clear and consistent approach across the district. Um, and recommendations specifically around enrollment in co-teaching classes, which are things that kind of fall after you establish a consistent process. And um, in the spreadsheet that I provided, you see more of the very specific actions around teacher training, <coughs> classroom assignment, uh, things of that nature. So we have, I, for the last several years, have been sending both general education and special education teacher teams off-site to co-teaching workshops. I mentioned that we were going to be working with an on-site coach consultant um, for this year, and we have been. Uh, she's working with our teams uh, grades 6 through 12, as well as the administrators, um, both curriculum directors, special ed coordinators, uh, Mr. McNeil, and the building principals. Um, the other piece that, again, the program recommendations are for a multi-year rollout. Um, I, once we establish a consistent practice at the secondary level, it makes sense to move to uh, looking at the work at the elementary level, um, but some of that groundwork requires things like the elementary schedule, so we have implemented a schedule that will allow for common instructional blocks, which was a, has been a barrier hist historically to um, really implementing co-teaching in the way that we have come to define and understand it um, through the workshops and trainings at the elementary level. Um, again, we've opened more sections at the high school to allow for more of that balanced enrollment um, in the classes. Uh, you know, there's a danger, and they speak to that in the report across districts, that they co-teaching classes become a catch-all, um, not only for special ed students, but English language learners, um, students who are receiving 504s, so that you really need, in order to make this happen, you need to make sure you're balancing the enrollment in those classes, um, and one of the ways, obviously, we need to do that is by expanding those. Um, and because of the model we established at Gibbs, we were able to expand it to more learning communities, whereas at Audison, the model they have allows for one learning community to have a co-teaching model, where it gives it spread across four learning communities. So you're going to see requests for professional development in the consultant in the budget, um, the increase in both general education and special education staffing in order to make this happen. I've said before, inclusion doesn't save us money. It, it may in out-of-district placements, but it, it, it costs money to do it and to do it well. Um, so it is not a cost savings, per se, to be providing this. Um, I spent a lot of time last year going over the professional development that um, we had done over the course of last year. We can come back in the um, spring to share what we've done this year. I didn't want to put all of the items in there. 
um, but the focus is on having a unified approach between general ed and special ed. Um, on our professional development to topics, specifically focusing on teacher assistance and the training they re require and receive, um, and just creating general awareness around special ed regulations, terminology, procedures um, across the district for all staff. Um, so as I mentioned, I shared last year very specifically the trainings that individuals had gone to. We've also created an all district training um, that everyone is required to take each year, which kind of gives an overview of the department, of special ed regulations, um, the process of special ed that was um, reviewed and approved by the DESE. Um, I provide weekly communication to the special ed staff around state and federal regulations. Um, and our new teacher orientation, because some of the recommendations were very acknowledged that things were in place, but people didn't always know where it was, who to go to, who to ask. Um, so we've kind of created for um, staff a scavenger hunt, so to speak, so that they learn to navigate the different places in the district where this information does exist or is shared, um, specifically whether it's our internal Google sites or department websites, um, things like that. Um, our legal counsel has presented to our administrative staff. Um, they'll actually be coming back on site. Um, they were on site in November to present to our uh, school counselors. And they'll be back in February, um, specific to the Medicaid training to work with our staff. Um, and that's the Medicaid expansion. Um, the new teacher orientation for all teachers, so I do um, a, I have two hours with all of the new staff, and so we use this year to focus on supporting students in inclusion and what it, how to work with another adult in the classroom, whether that be a preparer professional, whether it be a related service provider or another special educator, um, and how to support students in a way that um, focuses and uh, supports building independence, not dependence. And we'll continue with that for all new staff this coming year. Um, I mentioned the common planning time at the elementary schedule. Um, that was also a byproduct of the common instructional times. Um, and then also the AEA joint committee. Oh, where'd Jason go? Um, we have a joint committee of AEA and special education administrators that have been a group for three years. Um, we spent the last year collecting and analyzing district-wide data on staff needs for professional development as it relates to the inclusion of special ed students and diverse learners. And um, we shared this analysis with principals, curriculum directors, assistant superintendent, superintendent so that they can look at that information and determine how they also want to use, whether it's their building meeting time, department time, to focus on this. This was not just special educators that we gathered this information from. Um, and most recently, the DESE is revising their professional tool around is special education the right service. Uh, the recommendations were very specific around people questioning, like, what, what qualifies for a disability? How does a student, you know, um, how do you determine if a student's eligible for special education? Uh, the department is revising the tool that they've had, and several of us have uh, complete, uh, participated in um, a feedback session into that document, and then they're going to have follow-up, so we'll continue to work with the DESE on that tool, and once that's completed, that'll be a resource for us to use um, in district with staff. Um, and as I mentioned, you can look at the presentation I did last uh, June for more uh, description of the uh, professional development. The budget implications, um, obviously, are professional and development and the consultants, but also you've heard a lot of the curriculum directors ask for instructional coaches. I think I just want to reiterate again that this report was on inclusion practices, and special education is not the only one who's responsible for inclusion, and that the work that needs to be done to support all students, including special ed students, doesn't only have to be done by special educators. And when we have instructional coaches who are working on delivering the science curricula or the math curricula, they also have to help teachers be able to um, universally design their lessons and meet the needs of a range of learners. And so you're going to see um, the curriculum directors recognizing that need, and they're asking for instructional coaches in their um, budget requests. Uh, 
The next recommendations around team meetings were very specific to uh, creation of documents, um, a chain of command, um, a assessment handbook, a procedural manual, and uh, a very specific recommendation around, they labeled it team decision making, but it was very specific to the recommendation that learning specialist and special, or special education teacher complete the um, initial academic testing. Currently, the district's practices, the school psychologist does both um, the um, <coughs> cognitive battery as well as the academic. Um, and I mentioned in the uh, spreadsheet that this has been an issue the district has been trying to address with the union. Um, so we have created the communication ladder both for um, families as well as an internal one for staff members for them to be clear about who you go to for support or decision making or questions or um, where they should, um, who you should see for that, as well as um, I mentioned just orienting them to the places that all of these exist. Um, we already have an assessment handbook. Um, they didn't review it when they were on site. Um, that has been created and updated. Um, and a number of the man, they refer to a manual. We have that also, but it's an electronic resource. There's a shared drive. I think some of the recommendations, you know, um, were more generic in the nature of just how you would say it versus what um, we're not going to have, you know, 27 binders existing. We have a shared electronic resource for that. Um, there weren't any budget implications to that. Uh, the assigning of teaching assistance and the recommendation um, that we need to establish guidelines by which teaching assistants are assigned to a student, a group, a uh, program, or a classroom. I did want to note that we have both general education and special education um, paraprofessionals in the district. So there are both district processes around class size, TAs and um, building TAs and whatnot that are driven both by the collective bargaining agreement. Um, the, at the end of the day, if a paraprofessional goes into a student IEP, is it written into a student IEP, then that's a team decision. Um, that is made by the um, team members at the time when they're developing the IEP. However, we have begun to review um, rubrics, or we reviewed rubrics last year that were shared from other districts around how teams can collect data around that need to justify the need, um, whether it's for one-to-one -one, um, or whatnot, and then we've um, begun to implement a pilot of some of the selected rubrics to see what staff are finding most useful or um, helpful in that decision making, as well as the business office and human resources, creating some internal checks and hiring practices to make sure that um, when paraprofessionals are hired, that it has gone through the proper decision-making channels. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we've um, done training on the use of adult support in the inclusive classroom, and they reference a very specific advisory from the, the department, um, the DESE, around the use of paraprofessionals and how that can actually be more restrictive um, to a student's independence, and so that advisory has been shared with both special education staff and general education staff. Um, for those of you who've worked in special education, it, it's probably not surprising to learn that more often than not, it's the general educator who's asking for special ed, uh, a TA support rather than necessarily the special educator recommending the TA support. Um, so that advisory has been helpful to share with um, general educators as well. Um, uh, the uh, next recommendation was around oversight of the department. Um, it, this, as I mentioned, this report was from two years ago, so they were reflecting on um, the what had historically been um, turnover in the role of the director um, at the time, and so some of the recommendations are to allow the current director to um, make recommendations around um, programming and structure. Um, so not as many actionable items at this point. Um, as I mentioned, we've had a joint committee. Um, the previous year, um, the committee worked on job descriptions. There were recommendations around clearly defining roles and responsibilities and job descriptions. The joint committee has um, engaged in that work as well um, as our related service providers 
um, working with Wadigo Children's Services. We've presented to you previously on how we use the logic model to help kind of develop both what are the inputs and outputs that are necessary, and they've been working with um, our, our related service providers during our early release time <coughs> to develop that for each of their roles. Um, and there were specific recommendations around what we would say onboarding of new staff who aren't part of that orientation, and so the Director of Human Resources um, has created a Google Classroom, so staff who start after that orientation period are still getting that training that we are providing to everybody in August. Um, Another recommendation was around transition practices um, and the recommendation to be structured more sequ sequentially and consistent. Um, this is another area in which we have both general education and special education transition. Um, our special education transition is pretty prescriptive. Um, we have um, very specific meeting times, documents that teams are sharing, we meet for uh, we'll be meeting in the first week of March to um, go from e each elementary school to the Gibbs where our, the special education staff from fifth grade special education staff will be meeting with the sixth grade special education staff and going through each of the IEPs of incoming students. Um, we do that again from sixth to seventh um, and then there is an eighth to ninth grade um, transition process as well as from <coughs> preschool to kindergarten. Um, memorializing those so they are written and that they don't exist with just the people who know them um, is what we've been working on and so this year we'll be working on making sure that that middle to high school transition um, gets memorialized. Um, I didn't speak to the general education practices because they're not undertaken by the special ed department um, here but the recommendations were there were recommendations specific to general education as well. Um, the evidence-based uh, review of evidence-based practice um, that is, and this started to come into when we got um, some of this in the appendices um, for various special education instruction in both in-class support and the programs um, in the district um, and a recommendation for unified data collection. Um, in the spreadsheet, I note that they noted that there is data collection, but that each, you know, practitioners are using their own form of data collection and they made the recommendation that there be a unified one. Um, in reviewing that recommendation, we've been looking at that and have seen that there's a reason that people are using individual things because it's often tied to the specific goal that you've written, um, what you're um, collecting data on and how you're collecting it, but that we do need to work on how we're writing those goals so that the data collection becomes more obvious um, and more efficient. Um, and so we'll be working with, and we have been working with staff on that. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to bring um, Dr. Keith in, who's been working with us on co-teaching, and hopefully Dr. Orkin, who's been working on us with reading, to speak specifically about the work that they have been doing with both our elementary special educators around reading, that's Dr. Oregon, and um, Dr. Keith has been doing with um, our special ed and general educators around um, classroom instruction regarding co-teaching. We have purchased an executive functioning curriculum to um, pilot in the middle school this year, and they're using that. And um, it does identify a need to also um, think about how we communicate or provide education around the purposes of academic support. The, the several of the um, explanations were very specific to the academic support model and that understanding that academic <coughs> support isn't homework help. Um, and so we need to work on um, how we are messaging what the purpose of academic support is because it's not to complete your homework or your long-term assignments, it's to learn how to do that. And how do you apply this skill to several different assignments that you have. And you may be working on an individual assignment to practice that, but it's not that you're going in there to get your homework done each day um, or get help while you complete your homework. Um, that's not the intent of academic support, so we need to do more education and training around that. Um, and that um, executive function, and I don't want to go into a huge description of executive function, but executive function strategies need to be embedded into the work of all of our educators. Um, executive function isn't an individual thing, it's a, um, a set of cognitive skills that may not be fully <coughs> developed until um, into young adulthood and unfortunately for males, it may be even be a little bit later than um, for females, um, into your 
early 20s. So we all need to be working on this, whether a student has an identified weakness in that area, because it's a developmental need. Um, and so that's something that we need to be working on across the district. Again, you're going to see requests for professional development, consultants um, to continue the program development that we've been doing with our sub-separate programs, as well as uh, instructional materials that may accompany that. Um, specifically, we have a library, oh, um, a decodable text library that we're looking to purchase as some of those instructional materials to support the work that we're doing with reading. Um, they recommend that we continue to further develop and expand our program options for the um, special education process. Uh, we look at this every year as we're preparing for the budget, um, you know, to see where our needs lie. Um, last year, you um, saw that we requested staff, increased staffing to the summit program and to, to expand the compass program at the high school level because we recognized the need for those populations. Um, also, there was recommendations um, specific to um, supporting staff who are working with specific populations. So our high school, the summit program is our first students um, identified with emotional impairment. Those are some of the individuals Dr. Jenger mentioned who are the kind of those leads on collaborative problem solving. They've also been working with McLean's Hospital because we do do a um, school-based DBT and um, over the last two years we have been, we trained um, with them and now McLean's is doing an on-site consultation with us. Um, the director of school counseling and SEL and I have created a district-wide behavioral health team uh, to kind of address those professional, that professional population uh, that really addresses our students' behavioral health, whether that's school counselors, school social workers, school psychologists, school nurses, the BCBAs, all of those individuals that um, help to support behavioral health. Um, and so we are creating that district-wide committee. Um, I mentioned some of the consultants who are working with us. Um, I know that there had been a question around um, the five-year plan and we had, for this year, had proposed an addition, an expansion of the SLC. Um, <coughs> Ms. Morgan was asking about um, why that was not in this year's um, request because it had been noted last year. And as I mentioned, when we review for the budget each year, we look at where our um, population um, and our enrollment trends are, and the SLC programs at Brackett and Dallin, where we had proposed initially adding a class, have really stayed steady. Um, the Brackett program is 12 between two classrooms, and Dallin has 10, um, and so we're not seeing a projecting uh, significant increase to that, um, so we do not need an additional class at this point. Um, a class is generally a teacher and two to three um, either TAs or BSPs. So um, that's why you saw that decrease in the request from the previous, um, from the five-year plan. And um, another recommendation uh, was made around entrance and exit guidelines. Um, this is an area that in working with our legal counsel, we also recognize we're never going to have hard and fast cutoffs because it's an individual determination. So it is not going to be that you must have a score below this level on this, you know, test in order to be eligible for this program, or you have to have met, you know, these very specific criteria. But we do have the work that we've been doing, and I shared with you at last year around that logic model we developed for the summit program at Audison. Um, We've been doing that. We did it with the REACH program at the high school and at uh, Stratton as well and Dallin. That really helps to define who are the students that um, are served by this program. What are their needs and then how do you plan for those needs? And in the logic model, you can see that we say what, it, what are the needs, what are the um, practices, uh, evidence-based practices that are matched to those needs. So whether that's DBT, which is one of the outcomes um, for Summit, was to look at for students who have anxiety, what is an evidence-based um, uh, program for that, and DBT was that. And so then staff got trained in school-based DBT, um, and, has, and that's part of their program profile. So we've been doing that work with Widico since 2015 and kind of working our way through the programs at the different level in the high school. Um, as I mentioned, that was not reviewed as part of this uh, evaluation um, and that recommendation to create that. Um, we have those materials. Um, 
though we haven't, they did have a very specific recommendation around doing something very similar with our related service providers, and that's what we have been doing that during that early release time um, that we get for uh, Tuesday afternoons. So again, the budget implication for that, you're going to see the request for the consultant. Um, program oversight and staffing, this was very specific to who do staff report to, who are the supervisors and evaluators. Um, this is largely uh, dictated by the collective bargaining agreement, um, who supervises and evaluates. Um, and it is shared by the special ed coordinator for that level and the building principal. Um, or their designee if in the secondary level, it may be another administrator. Um, and they recommended, which we've been doing um, since 2014, the continuation of the monthly meetings that I have with both, with each principal as well as that special education coordinator so that we can go over issues <coughs> specific to that building. All right, questions? Mr. Hainer? I didn't catch the time. <laughs> On the IEP, is it uh, specific who delivers the service regard as a teacher uh, or a TA and how many are being involved in that, that right. service? Right, so when you delivery? have a grid, so you would see a service delivery grid and you're going to have um, both the service, like the goal area, the service, and then the service provider. So in that, the personnel who are responsible, so it may say a special educator right. and a TA or a TA, you know, it might say the uh, uh, OT occupational therapist, uh, if we have a speech and language pathologist assistant, they might, so it's indicated for each individual student. It, is it possible for just a TA to be delivering a service? A, yeah, a TA can deliver instruction, they cannot design instruction. I, I understand that, yeah. and I assume there will be somebody supervising the, the, yeah. the delivery. So the special education teacher is the one who's designing and the right. um, instruction that they're delivering, and they're the ones who are still ultimately responsible for the supervision. Okay. While not the evaluative supervision, you know, that comes through the collective bargaining agreement, but the day-to-day -day supervision the of that. The evaluative part of the delivery of the service yeah. part. The, my second question, if I may, uh, you mentioned before uh, legal consultants for administrators. Why? What, what's being provided for that? The, the, our legal counsel did presentations. Um, one of the recommendations was around um, uh, training for specific special ed regulations. So this summer, I shared with you last year some of the training they've done on site, but this past in August, uh, we solicited questions from administrators in advance of our retreat and um, two of the attorneys from Stoneman Chandler Miller, our, our law firm, came and did a presentation uh, around questions around 504. Um, what were some of the other topics? A little bit on, I mentioned we were doing one on the Medicaid expansion. Let me, let me, let me be more specific. Does it talk about our liability with delivery of service or is it? No, they're, no, it's like a by, workshop so that they understand what the, yeah, what's statute. required. So student discipline, um, bullying okay. investigations, what the regulations require us to do okay. and what that looks like in practice. Thank you. Um, Manifestation determination. Sorry? I'm sorry? Manifestation determination review. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? No? Well, thank you for this update. Um, so... I guess my, my comment would still be, um, you know, we, we, we want to fund more <laughs> to help you. Um, and it seems like there's a lot, there's a piece here in professional development and a piece over here and, and you know, this and a piece here for consultant. Um, but, you know, we're not, we're not, I mean, and the budget's already being written, but it would be good to, it would be good to see that in the narrative somewhere that there's, these 10 pots of money that are all going towards improving our inclusion practices. Okay. Um, just so we can see that as an initiative that the district is pursuing, mm -hmm. okay. even though it is all spread out across these different areas. Okay. Sure. Dr. Alice Mampi? Um, as I was listening to this, I was also thinking that we could use language like that also as we bring our budget request to the town that it feels like it's harder and harder to draw a fast line between this is special education mm -hmm. and this is regular education, like the coaching. Right. Where do you put the coaching and stuff? And I feel like we need to 
we're going to have to talk about whether we can continue supporting this idea of a hard and fast line when you know so much of it is falling into more of it's falling into gray areas because that's mm -hmm. the better way to serve our students yes um, Agreed. so yeah. but it would be helpful to have mm -hmm. that in your narratives mm -hmm. like the things that you were telling us about how um, what the coaches are are doing mm -hmm. um, so that it's easier for me to remember if I read it too. Uh -huh. So I can speak with um, Julie Dunn and Michael Mason around. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Just in support of that, the idea of inclusion and co-teaching uh, blends this in, but they're required by statute as well. So the, the, that impetus is there. It is gray, but there is still the regulatory requirement to, to if, if an IEP says that a child will be included in such and such, We've got to do that. We don't have a choice on that aspect, and so we have to pay for it. Right. So. But, and the idea is that, I mean, in co-teaching, the class sizes are generally smaller. Um, I, so I think what we will look at is the composition of the class in right, general. Right. Um, and so, I mean, there, we have been at the high school able to create smaller cohorts. Um, but my point is that requires more yes. general ed teachers. Exactly. Well, right. yes. So, so to, right. Where yeah. you saw that implication was both general ed and learning yeah. specialist increase. Yeah. Yep. So. And the training of that, that general ed teacher into the special ed aspect of that thing, again, it, which budget does it come out of? Right. It, it, right. So. Yeah. right. So currently right now the special ed department is funding that consultant to work with both the both general teachers. educators right. exactly. and the special educator. Right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so uh, Mr. Mason is not able to attend tonight, um, so I don't think we'll have a budgetary discussion unless there's anything that we need to talk about. But if you have the documents and you have any questions, you can email him. So for the monthly financial report, that's next. Uh, we do have the monthly financial report, um, but there's, <laughs> if anybody has any questions, send them to Michael. Um, right. I did notice that he updated the transfers. That was the one change um, that I noted. Um, so he, he did actually move the money around mm -hmm. uh, to reflect where things were hitting this year. So that's a good update. So next, Mr. Schliffman, the superintendent search consultant. Okay. On the 15th, we had a uh, meeting which uh, contained some really good conversations with uh, the two members of the subcommittee as well as Mr. Hainer was there. So we had really thoughtful discussion that, that allowed us to narrow down the uh, text for the RFP and although authorized to move forward because it hasn't hit the streets yet I'll offer a motion to approve uh, the RFP and then uh, outline a couple of highlights in, in the uh, RFP. Second. Second. Okay, so if we take a look at the first page under scope of work overview, I want to emphasize that around C and D, uh, one of the things that we're looking for is very extensive community input. Uh, this is something we've done in the past. This is uh, a hallmark of what we do as a committee. Uh, when we did the uh, Give School, we had very extensive community input uh, moving forward, and we're emphasizing the needs to have as many constituencies as we can identify uh, as participants. Um, and the search pro uh, process management, I will highlight a couple of the dates. Is it's our intent to hit the streets with an ad or, uh, no later than September 18th, uh, the closing date no later, no later than October 16th, with our goal of uh, selecting uh, a new superintendent by December 17th. Uh, of course, the text is there unless it's mutually uh, agreed upon by the school committee and the consultant, which gives us the opportunity to move things back if we need to, but these are the target dates we're advertising in our RFP so that any consultant we're hiring is aware of that. Down to the fourth page <laughs> under selection process, again, I want to emphasize the fact that we are um, looking to make sure that there is a diverse body of community members who are going to participate in the process all the way through. Um, and back uh, 
another couple of pages to minimum evaluation criteria. This is the part that's most important for us now. Our goal is to have a selection made of a consultant no later than March 26th so that we will be looking at a window for presentations by potential consultants in a window between February 24th and March 12th. Uh, those are the highlights. I think that we have been pretty explicit in what we think our community needs in terms of, uh, of a search process. We are very committed to having an open and inclusive search process and hiring a consultant who will help us to deliver that for the community. Great. Is there a question, Mr. Hainer? Not a question. I just want I don't say this enough. Uh, ever. I think you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All of you. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, thank you. This good work here. Uh, my question is, so we're hoping to hire the search consultant by uh, March, and that means in April, May, June of this year, they would start the community conversations? Yeah, exactly. Our intent is to have the community <coughs> conversations April, May, June, so that all the documentation and reports will be ready to go in September. So as soon as we get past Labor Day, we can go hit the street with a um, uh, with, with all the documentation uh, relevant to the job description, to the desired characteristics uh, it, right after Labor Day. So uh, that's the reasoning behind our tunnel. Will there be a, um, it, when during this time frame will there be a, there'll be a meeting with the school committee a week? Oh yeah, yeah, that will be a, a part of it. We're just setting forth the, the basics. So of course, we're, the school committee is going to be the one who's going to be approving all the final uh, steps through here. Um, uh, approving the uh, search committee, approving the documentation, uh, uh, basically mm -hmm. anything that is a decision is to be made. It, it's the decision of the full school committee. Uh, that's our job. No, I, I know that. But yeah. so my question is, um, <clears throat> Is there going to be a point while the um, consultant is meeting with different groups, will there be a, a time where they meet with us? Oh, and, I'm sure, yeah. yeah, yeah and do yeah. a kind of a survey of what uh, yeah. we're looking for? I, I'm sure, yeah, definitely. Yes. Okay. That, that's, that certainly uh, yep. is an important part of it. Okay. Yeah, that's under the it, two section C. It says, including but not limited to blah, 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 elected and appointed government of town government officials. Yeah, that I saw that. Good. I just wanted to make sure we were one of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, seeing the oh, consultant I'm elected now the for yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, check, yeah. Yeah. Is that, will that, I just, so, okay. Yeah. So, in the, in the, will it be a separate meeting or will it just be part of a regular meeting? You know it depends on what we want to do. Okay. You know, we don't have, we don't have to decide the parameters. This is basically the framework, the outer boundaries for what our expectations are. Uh, once we hire the consultant, we can work with them to further define the process so that we can have the input that we want in, in terms of the uh, initial criteria. Great. Any other comment questions? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any opposed or abstentions? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you, Thank you for your work on this. Who seconded that? No. I did. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. Might be cool. All right, superintendent's report. Uh, Dr. McNeil will. Yes, so I have a couple of announcements uh, for some events that are coming up. Um, the, two th the 2020 Regional High School Art Show, which will take place at the Lexington Arts and Crafts um, Society Gallery. Uh, the Arlington High School Visual Art Department is pleased to announce that over 60 uh, Arlington High School student artworks are part of a regional high school exhibit at the Lexington Arts and Crafts Society Gallery. Uh, if people, this, this event will take place this Sunday, January 26, uh, from 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, all community members, parents, and friends are welcome. There will be plenty of parking and refreshments are provided. The dress is casual. Um, and there is a flyer. I have right here and I'll make sure that I can get it out to the community as well. Um, I'd like to also highlight uh, our uh, students in the art department. 
and in particular in David Moore's um, digital photography course, um, which uh, students were selected to show their work at the Griffin Museum uh, Secondary School Pho Photography e Exhibition at the Kearney Gallery um, Regis College Fine Arts Center in Weston uh, during the month of January. Uh, Arlington High School student Jamison Sparks won a pre prestigious third place award. Uh, 26 regional high schools and 104 students participated in this juried exhibition. The sponsor of this exhibit, the Griffin Museum in Winchester, offers workshops and courses in photography and honors local and national professional photographers with exhibitions. So I'd like to highlight um, student Jamison Sparks. Congratulations. And I'd also like to highlight one of our, David Moore, who is um, a photography teacher at the high school. He has been selected as a AP teacher panelist for the 2020 AP Art and Design Standard Setting. David teaches the AP Studio Art courses at Arlington High School. Only nine art teachers nationwide were selected for this important panel. Um, AP Art and Design Standard Setting will be conducted at the Renaissance Tampa International Plaza Hotel in Tampa, Florida. All travel and lodging expenses will be covered by the College Board and panelists will receive a 1500 honorari honorarium for their participation. I'd, I'd like to also highlight an event that will take place this Saturday. It's the annual Battle of the Bands. Mm -hmm. It will take place um, at the Regent Theater. Doors will open at 7 p.m. Uh, join us for a night of live music performed by seven fantastic student bands and a special appearance by Arlington High School own, own, Arlington High School's own teacher band, the Educated Guest. Um, proceeds will benefit Save the Children and their support for child refugees around the world. Advanced tickets are $15. You can get yours during all three lunches on Friday if students want to attend. Tickets will also be available at the Regent Theater box office for $18 the night of the show. This is a very exciting event. We don't want community members to miss out. And that concludes the, what Great. I have to share. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda. All items listed are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. Can you? There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number. I yeah, just uh, want to pull the trip. Yeah, me okay. too. <laughs> Approval of warrant, warrant number 20140, dated 114-2020, total amount 487-645.10. Approval of minutes, regular school committee minutes, there are none. And there's already a request to hold the trip, so it's just the warrant. Move to, to approve move. the warrant. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? None. Okay. It's unanimous. Uh, the trip, are we holding it because it's probably a new trip or? Well, I, I, I've got a question. Are we on to a new form? I noticed it was quite lengthy and a yeah. little cumbersome to go through. A, 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 it's just a, 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 an administration uh, Thing. I'm not going to hold up my vote on it. I'm still going to vote to approve it, but uh, I'm just curious. My, my question was whether it's actually a new trip or so a new trip has to be presented, whereas a repeat trip can go into the consent agenda, and it wasn't clear from the form whether it's right. a new or a, re, or a repeat trip. Okay. I don't remember ever mm -hmm. seeing one like this. Ms. Seuss? Yeah, I have a substantive question. I know one of the things we've talked about many times with these trips is that while Arlington Public Schools um, helps facilitate communication and provides a meeting space to parents that these are not Arlington Post School trips per se, right? They're not, we don't sponsor them. And I had a problem, and I'd never seen this language before. Uh, if you look under, uh, at the very end of that very long thing that's been pasted in maybe a funny place, pre-trip prep in that very end, it says that history teachers will be asked to mention the trip to their classes of sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and I don't think it's appropriate to require teachers to mention a trip in their class time. I think we, they can, you know, we can send messages yeah. through emails and stuff like that, but I think that being a requirement of the program is problematic in my opinion. Okay. 
Okay, so let's find out whether it's a repeat trip. Mm -hmm. If it's a repeat trip, then they can go back on the consent agenda. If it's not, then we would want one of the teachers to come to present. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Agreed? All right. Uh, no policy changes. Subcommittee liaison reports. Budget. So budget, we met yesterday morning. Um, we discussed uh, the financial reporting, um, and we have some some specific changes to make to the uh, reports. We also discussed the budget book. Um, what else did we discuss? We discussed lots of things. Um, Mr. Mason was unable to uh, join us, so um, I'll be communicating these things to him. Uh, was there anything else that we need to mention? I don't think so at this point. We'll be uh, meeting again later, but we have to do policies and procedures. Nothing. No report. Uh, CIA. She is not here. Community relations. I need to talk to Kathy first before. Okay. Uh, facilities. I will be making a facilities presentation to the Dallin PTO on January 28th at 7 p.m. <coughs> and the Otis and Gibbs PTO on February 4th at 7 p.m. Great. Anything from the building committee? We have a public hearing on Tuesday, February 4th at 7 p.m. in the high school auditorium, and we'll be explaining uh, the phasing of the project, and it's a good time for incoming eighth graders, eighth grade parents coming into the high school and high school parents to come to the meeting, as well as the butters. Great. May I just also say that uh, Mr. Thielman sent out an email pertaining to the uh, more technical description of the geothermal. I'm very appreciative of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I have to give credit to Ryan Katowski. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> Thank you. Uh, okay. Calendar committee. Um, we have a meeting scheduled, I think, in a week or two years. All right. Very soon. Uh, election monitor. I don't know if that should be listed on here, but election monetization committee. Uh, we have another meeting next. Uh, we had a meeting that I think I've told you about. Uh, superintendent search process we just heard from, nothing on negotiations. Are there any other announcements or liaison reports? Yes, Ms. Seuss. So I went to a wellness committee meeting, which I th it's been interesting, and heard from the nurse at Dallin, who is um, piloting a program um, to sort of restructure the way that the great body shop is taught and and to bring some of the material that was taught in, in the fifth grade, you know, the sort of that stinky talk that people talk about, um, to fourth grade, and in very age appropriate, and then, may, and then maybe think about how fifth grade is going to be treated differently. Um, cutting out things like um, talking about the um, endocrine system, which students don't quite get, mm -hmm. and in a very age appropriate way, talking about issues of um, consent, gender identity and expression. Um, you know, gender, um, uh, sexual preferences, but in very, you know, the way she spoke about it, it was very, it felt very, very age appropriate. So um, that's very exciting happening there. There's discussions about whether that will be a suggested curriculum change. And I said, once they work everything out, they will come to us, but they're not there yet. So just to tell you, it's on the horizon. Great. Yeah. Anything else? This was announcements too, correct? Yeah. So um, I didn't hear the uh, acap acapella. I can't pronounce it. Acapella. Uh, acapella <laughs> festival to belt out cancer. The fourth annual is tomorrow um, at here at the high school, 7 p.m. to 9:30. Um, it's a benefit concert to raise funds for the Catherine J. Malatista Foundation whose mission is to fund research into cures for sarcoma cancer. And it also remembers Catherine Malatista of Arlington, who died at age 16 after a seven and a half month, month battle with epithelioid sarcoma. So. Yes, great, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, any future agenda items? All right, we don't have any executive session. Great, can I get a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. It's been vivid. <laughs>